Let's see, make sure this is working properly. Okay, there we go. All right. Now, just to make sure. Okay, now that is going. I will also start the Zoom recording as our backup. Okay. All right, there we go. So here we are. We're ready to, to go on uh, evening three of the uh, Altaz workshop. Uh, tonight, we're going to start with with Tomo talking about refiguring his 14 inch of 2.6 meniscus, uh, following by Richard talking about the science capabilities of the EV scope, which uh, I think is a going to be, based on comments from the first night, should be a really good follow on to um, uh, the conversation we had around science uh, require, uh, instrument requirements for, for science that's useful for um, double stars. And then I have the, um, uh, the pleasure of giving the Peter Abraham's astronomical history talk, <clears throat> followed by an update on my 28 inch scope that I retrofitted with Ed's uh, complete ventilation system. So that's our lineup for tonight. I'm gonna hand it over to Tom who is been standing on the shoulders of giants. Thank you very much, Howard. So presentation is visible? Yep. yep. Cool. OK. So uh, yeah, I, uh, I titled this talk Shoulders of Giants because um, it, you know, Howard very graciously asked me to present on, on my project um, because he and, and I guess some others felt that, you know, what I had done was somewhat significant. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't want to pretend like I'm an expert in any of this stuff. And I have very much stood on the shoulders of giants um, to get to, you know, what I ended up getting to. Um, so I do want to sprinkle this talk in with a lot of shout outs to the people that helped me get there. So basically this talk is about um, the refiguring that I recently did on my 14 inch F 2.6 meniscus mirror. And, and I guess the significant thing here is that I did it by hand and, um, and came up with some pretty decent results. So um, the, the project is called Artemis um, and I came up with the name before NASA did. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is Artemis here. And basically it's a, it's a fast, F 2.6 thin meniscus mirror, and it's inside of a Mel Bartels inspired, inspired telescope design. So you can see it looks very much like Mel's zip daub, uh, not by accident. Um, I was just so enamored with it when I first saw the zip daub that I, that I wanted one of those. Um, you know, and what, what I love about it is that it's got this real marriage of function and form, you know, the OTA um, serves as the altitude bearings and it, it just, all comes together in a really, really sweet package. And, uh, and, and ultimately, you know, when, when I did display it publicly, you know, people were walking by going like, what the heck is that? And, and they were just like, so blown away by the look of it. So I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Um, and where it all started. And what I'm going to do is, is since not everyone is familiar with Artemis and, and kind of the arc that it went through, I'm going to kind of give an overview of the project before I actually get into, you know, kind of the, the meat of the talk, which is, you know, the, the refiguring part of it. Um, but Artemis, um, because it's a thin meniscus mirror, it started by slumping. And uh, basically, I started this project in late 2015, which is kind of scary, you know, looking at, at the fact that, you know, I was still working on it. Um, you know, as recently as a couple of months ago. Um, but yeah, it started in late 2015 when I just randomly saw some pictures of Mel's uh, zip dub on the internet. And, um, and, and it started out by me meeting virtually, um, you know, the, the uber giants of all of this, which is Mel and David Davis. And they sort of started me on this path of, of constructing Artemis. 
and and the very first step, um, you know, uh, to to kind of uh, go from David Davis is to construct a computer controlled kiln because you know I, I didn't have any ready access to slumping facilities around me, so um, so I needed to create my own computer con uh, controlled kiln. Um, just kind of as, as sort of a, an overview of the whole timeline here, you know, in late 2015, this is when I started the project. Um, and through 26, um, it, so late 2015 is when I started to construct the kiln. I was fortunate enough to get a kiln off of Craigslist, um, but I still had to um, put all the electronic guts into it to give it the appropriate um, uh, smarts to do the slumping. Um, and then 2016 was basically about slumping, grinding, and polishing. So it took a, took a while for me to get to the point where I could actually slump the glass. And it wasn't just about constructing the kiln. It was about figuring out the right way to make the forms, calibrating the kiln to the right temperatures to make sure that that was working, getting the right form recipe. And so it took a while to get it all to, to happen. Um, but eventually it did, and I got the, got the glass slumped and ground and polished um, throughout 2016. And um, through the spring of 2017 was when I was doing the final figuring of, of the mirror. And then um, a catastrophic failure happened. Um, in August of 2017, um, I was up at my cottage and the mirror was ready for its uh, first real star tests. And, um, and I was kind of playing around with my star test rig. Um, and unfortunately, one key design element that I left out of the star test rig was a tip clip. And, uh, and I tilted it a little bit too far. The glass tipped out, landed on the driveway and ended up in two pieces. Um, it was a very Zen moment for me. Um, and uh, I was surprised at how well I took it. Um, I did not huck it into the forest, um, and I just kind of picked up the pieces and uh, told my wife that I just broke my mirror. Um, and if you know, if we go back to here, this is like um, 18 months worth of work that was basically in two pieces on the driveway. Um, the uh, outcome of that was uh, a month or two of uh, what am I going to do now? Um, and what I ended up doing was rebooting from there. And um, I managed to glue the two pieces of glass together. And from that glass, I cast a new form for the kiln and, uh, and slumped a new piece of glass. And while the timeline from, um, to get to that point was 18 months you know, for that first broken piece of glass, um, within less than six months, I was star testing again. So that learning curve throughout 2015, 2016, 2017, you know, paid off and I was able to replicate my results in under six months, which was, which was quite, um, I was quite happy with that. Um, so by March of 2016 or 2018, I was already star testing um, in a proper star test rig. Now, the thing was that the star test results were kind of um, inconclusive. And, and it wasn't clear, um, you know, that, that I had a good figure or not. Um, and part of it was because, you know, the star test, like all star test rigs, there was kind of a quick and dirty thing. And, um, and as a result, I couldn't, you know, clearly determine that um, artifacts that I was seeing were in the mirror or whether they were artifacts of the um, rig itself. And so since I had to build the OTA eventually, um, I decided to um, stop on the mirror at that point and get the rest of Artemis constructed so that I could do the final star testing in the actual OTA itself. And that was, um, that was a considerable effort. Um, as you can see from that original picture, there was you know, quite a lot of woodworking to do and it really stretched my woodworking skills. Um, so it was a non-trivial job to get the um, to get the the infrastructure for Artemis built. However, um, throughout the course of 2018, I was able to do that and uh, was able to complete the star testing um, to the point where um, you know we were all and I say we you know through the people that were helping me um, like Mel um, and and others who were contributing on the Oregon Scopeworks um, mailing list. Um, you know, we thought that it was it was basically ready to be silvered. 
And silvering is indeed one of the other kind of main uh, main parts of Artemis that, that that's um, a little bit more groundbreaking. Um, now, obviously, you know, a number of people on this call now have silvered their mirrors, um, but Artemis's mirror was one of the first ones that got uh, spray silvered. Um, Howard did go first, and and uh, Peter Peckerar was another one that uh, that did silvering. Um, but uh, but I think mine was the third. Um, but I you know I I was on the shoulders of giants again. So Howard blazed trails here. Peter blaze trails. Rob Brown did some awesome work on um, measuring um, reflectivity, um, as well as doing tests on um, what was ultimately going to be our uh, product of choice for protecting the silver, which is the Midas tarnish shield. Um, so again, other giants that, uh, you know, that, that I stood on the shoulders of. So once it got silvered, um, it made its first public showing um, at Starfest in Ontario, here in Ontario. Um, which is where I am. Um, and then after that, a month or two after that, at the Black Forest Star Party in Pennsylvania. And um, the, um, the results were, were good. Uh, I mean, you know, if, if we look at the, the Ronke and the eyepiece, for example, here, you know, it, it looks really, really good. Now, if you look really, really closely, you'll see some roughness, um, but still the overall Ronke gram um, was very, very good. Um, and yet, I had performance anxiety. Uh, basically, um, you know, in, in public, the people that looked through it were really, really um, impressed with how good the views were. I mean, at F2.6, I had like really, really stunning wide views of the veil of Andromeda. Um, we were able to easily see galactic cirrus or IFNs around Andromeda, for example, and it wasn't just me and it wasn't just Mel, um, you know, but other people who were looking through my scope, you know, once, once I, 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 once I knew what to look for, I could tell other people what to look for and they were able to see this sort of thing. So generally speaking, people looking through the scope were really, really impressed with it. Um, and, and in fact, I went to the Black Forest Star Party explicitly because Mel was going to be there and I wanted him to have hands-on use. And, you know, and, and he also, you know, said that, you know, the views through it were really good. So, um, so generally, you know, it, it kind of passed the sniff test. And yet still, to me, there were lingering performance issues. And it was specifically around high powered views. Um, so, for example, planetary views, which is admittedly not necessarily what, a, you know, an F2.6 is, is designed for. Um, but I was, I was um, uh, disappointed in the planetary views. They were very soft, um, especially when I compared them side by side to other scopes of similar size. Um, you know, at these at these different star parties, um, and and then the other thing that was that was to me, you know, really disappointing was double splitting. So the double double, for example, you know, was barely splittable, and and I found that very disappointing too. And you know, and and so, you know. It, it got to the point where the more I used it, the more annoyed I got by some of these some of these lingering issues. And so there was an ongoing discussion about, you know, what am I supposed to do about this or what, what can I do about this? And, and, and really, you know, the questions were, you know, where does the blame lie? Do we blame, for example, collimation or do we blame the eyepiece, you know, at, at fast speeds, not, not, not all eyepieces are created equal. Um, and, and so, uh, um, you know, Mel in particular was, you know, was saying, you know, you, you need to make sure you have a good high quality eyepiece at those higher magnifications to, to take that, um, you know, uh, steep uh, focal cone. So anyhow, or, or obviously, you know, as a last resort, is it something that's baked into the primary? So um, I spent a bunch of months trying to kind of debug the problem. I had, uh, I had my old uh, eight inch F7 where I would do sort of side-by-side -side comparisons um, of, of double stars in particular. Um, I was doing things like um, masking my mirror to see how that changed the optics. Um, I did in fact get a number of eyepieces and trial the different, uh, a bunch of different eyepieces to see if that made any difference. You know, but uh, I mean, even with, uh, I ended up getting a Teleview Nagler um, at, the, at the high power and, uh, you know, and even that was still underwhelming. So basically after all my options were exhausted, 
And I, and at this point, you know, it had been silvered for like a year and a half. Um, and so it needed to be re-silvered anyway. I decided that I'm going to, once I take the silver off, I'm going to just try and tweak the surface a little bit with just some light polishing to try and get it, um, to try and get it to be a little bit smoother. Because if we look at this Ronke image here, um, you know, while the match to, you know, to the parabola was quite good, if you look at this image, you know, there's a lot of roughness that you can see in the lines. And so it would not be a huge stretch to say, you know what, the high powered views are affected by the fact that you just have surface roughness and, you know, which is very clear on this. And so I figured since I'm taking the silver off anyhow, why don't I try and tweak the surface a little bit and try and smooth it out? Well, of course, and, and and sort of in the back of my head, you know, I was also thinking if in the if in the outside chance I screw it up, all of my prior figuring runs were about 15 hours. And, and actually, I had figured this mirror about four times now at this point, and each one seemed to be roughly consistent at about 15 hours of figuring time. So I figured if I did hose the, the, the figure, uh, I'd be out 15 hours and I, and I could you know, be back to where I started from. And of course, just cleaning up ended up wrecking the figure. Um, you know, when I, when I tried to do very, very light polishing and still keep the figure, um, one of the, one of the techniques, um, you know, that I tried was to use a shaped lap and, and I should have known better, um, because every time I've tried a shape lap in all of my figuring runs, it never worked. Um, and indeed in this case, the, the pedal lap just didn't work for me. Um, so this is one of those things on the internet. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. So you might want to look away. But, um, you know, but this is ultimately, you know, what I ended up with using the shape lap, um, as you can see, horrible, horrible um, texture um, uh, put onto the, the surface of the mirror. Um, and so at this point, I was committed. Um, and I needed to basically go back to um, sphere and then and then refigure. But as I say, I thought I was only going to be about 15 hours out. Now, in reality, I, I haven't added up the number of hours. It turned out to be quite a bit more than 15, but it wasn't like 100 hours. So, um, you know, it all worked out in the end. Sorry, I'm giving away the, the, final, <laughs> the final answer. But, um, you know, even after just a little bit of work, um, I got the smoothness back. So you can see here, it's substantially smoother. But, um, you know, but as far as the matching Ronke goes, the figure was totally wrecked. So, you know, th this might look like a good figure, but it, it really wasn't for, you know, for my particular focal length and, and all of that. So at this point, the figure was completely useless. And the only option was to go back to sphere and then, and then reparabolize. But at least at this point, um, it was relatively smooth. So... As I started to do this, um, I got quite a lot of machine envy because at this point in time, I was figuring, Mel was figuring his 30 inches and Rob was figuring his uh, 16. And, um, and both Mel and Rob had machines at their fingertips. And I had a lot of machine envy because frankly, I was getting tired of pushing glass. And as it turns out, um, a, uh, an ATM friend here in Toronto um, was getting rid of all of his ATM stuff. And uh, he had a Miramatic that, uh, that he was willing to give to me. Now, and, and, up in, and at that point, I was actually thinking of pulling the trigger and building a Miramatic for myself so that I could do the same kind of magic that, that Mel in particular is doing you know, with, with all of his mirrors. So, but then this Miramatic landed in my lap and I picked it up and I tried to put it to use. Um, and, and I was thinking I was gonna be golden because Mel makes it look so easy. You know, he just has this machine and he puts a, a nice spider lap on it and just lets it run for, you know, hours and hours and hours and out comes a parabola at the other end. Really, really simple. So I thought I could do the same thing. Now the hiccup that I ran into was that this Miramatic that I inherited um, was, underpowered. It wasn't um, intended for a glass um, as big as 14 inches. It was really for like, you know, the six, eight inch kind of um, mirrors. So I was really pushing it. And, um, and, you know, a number of times it would, uh, it would not not stroke properly, and it would be, you know, fixed in one position. Um, and, and also, you know, I, I, my experience was very underpowered. So I was just not not well experienced with how to use these machines effectively. 
And so as a result, here's another thing that you just need to look away. You can't unsee it. Um, I induced an awful lot of astigmatism into the mirror just with that machine, um, which was a major disappointment. Um, and because I had high hopes for the machine. So at this point, I, I just, you know, put the machine away and was not tempted to use it again. And, uh, and I, you know, committed to basically finishing this mirror by hand. So the first job, it, you know, obviously was to get rid of the astigmatism. And, uh, and that was somewhat laborious, um, but fortunately, and what the, what the little images here on the, uh, the right-hand side are, um, is um, um, the Hubble, um, oh crap, what's it called now? Basically the artificial star um, thing. Um, so I was able to set up an indoor test where I could rapidly um, test the astigmatism using um, artificial stars. So I didn't have to do like a, you know, a bit of polishing and then wait for a clear night to, you know, to test my, um, to test my astigmatism. This, this gave me a really, really good, um, really good view of, bad astigmatism here, and then ultimately uh, get to the point where I could be very comfortable that my astigmatism has been has been polished out. Um, I figured since the machine polished it in, it was just a matter of handwork to polish it out. And indeed, after uh, a considerable amount of time, I was able to push, polish the astigmatism out. So then at that point, it became, um, you know, the effort of figuring. And one of the things that, uh, you know, that Howard wanted me to bring up here, and a number of people have mentioned this to me too, was the fact that I was able to do this A, by hand, B, with a full-sized lap only, um, and C, using one stroke and one stroke only. Um, and the stroke is the extreme W. So, uh, and, I, and I got this from Mel, um, so I didn't invent this, but, um, but what I ended up doing was sticking to one single stroke that I could do repeatedly, um, and then figuring out ways that I could tweak the stroke to affect the figure across the entire surface of the mirror. And so basically the mirror, so the lap is on the bottom and the mirror is on the top. And on the mirror, I drew a number of concentric circles representing different percentages of the diameter or radius. Um, and then all I did was basically do an extreme W to one of the lines, depending on how deep or how, um, where I wanted the action to go. And so by, you know, obviously if I had the mirror so that the, um, center of the mirror was close to the edge of the lap, then all of the action would be concentrated towards the center of the mirror. Uh, conversely, you know, if I only overhang the mirror by 25%, then the action was further from the center. And so by practicing a little bit, um, with these different, uh, different um, sizes of stroke, and, and sorry, I should say that the extreme W, I kind of tried to draw this in PowerPoint, um, I hope you get the idea here, but basically there's a W here that's kind of concentrated on one edge, and then you do a wide V to basically get you to the other side through the center, and then another W, and then you repeat it going back, and then you turn and step and repeat uh, ad nauseum. Um, and, and the only variation in the stroke is how far you overhang, which then determines the amplitude of the Ws. So basically, you know, if, if you overhang to here, then, then you, you do the W up to, you know, to this line here. If you're overhanging to here, then you just do the W to here. And that gave you a very repeatable uh, process and by practicing, I was able to kind of figure out the, the relative overhangs that gave me the action in the areas that I wanted to. So that basically I could just dial the correction in as I needed to. And at that point, it was just basically doing some polishing sessions, doing the, uh, the, the ronky tests and, uh, and repeating until I got to the point where, where I was done. And, um, and using the full size lap as opposed to smaller laps, um, avoided any kind of zonal roughness 
and just basically doing it with patience and, um, and, and nice gentle stroking, I was able to get a very smooth surface throughout the entire figuring process. So here's just sort of like an overview of, of how the figure slowly evolved. Um, and so it's kind of like a fun little progression and the, and it's, these are at different offsets too. So, you know, the ones that have the owl eyes are a little bit closer to the radius of curvature. These ones here are a little bit further out, but you can see how, you know, the, the shape is, is progressing, how the center is pinching and then, and then the, the par parabolization goes to the outside of the mirror. And so repeating this over and over and over again, I was able to get to this point here, which is pretty good. Um, and then it became a fine tuning exercise where I was doing very, very short sessions, you know, like of a minute or two. And, and then again, using this dialing in to sort of figure out where I needed to do the correction to smooth out kinks like here, you can see a kink here, you can see how some of these, you know, the center is really pinched. And, and then, you know, later on the, the center would be less pinched because I've moved the action out. So eventually I get to this point down here. And this point down here um, represents a really, really good match. It's not perfect. Here is basically um, the matching Ronke results. Um, and um, uh, so you can see, you know, it's not perfect up here, um, not perfect down here, and yet still it's really quite good. And when I did a star test in, inside of Artemis, so luckily I had a good, you know, star testing rig. I had the actual telescope itself. Um, I was able to do star tests and, and basically get to the point where I was really, really happy with the, with the figure. And uh, so much so that basically I, I, you know, committed to silvering it. So this is freshly silvered here. It's actually got water spots because I, I just finished silvering it and rinsing it off. So this was still drying at the time. So just to kind of put this back into perspective, here's what I started with and here's what I ended with. So the figure is, you know, you, you can see that they're the same mirror, um, but, um, but clearly there's a dramatic improvement in the, um, in the surface roughness or surface smoothness, I guess you could say. So I was very, very happy with that. So then what was the verdict? Um, well, the, the most important thing, the acid test for me was the double-double. Um, and it turns out that I was able to cleanly split the double-double. So for me, that was a success. However, I, I, I need to say that I can split the double-double under the right conditions because I took it out the other night and, um, and I could not split the double-double. Um, partly, I think, because um, I was doing it in my backyard and, um, and I was, um, the double-double was over my house. So basically I was looking over top of my roof. So there was probably, um, you know, uh, heating, differential heating and whatnot, to, you know, that was contributing to, um, to air turbulence and whatnot. So, you know, the, the moral here is that I could split the double-double, but the conditions have to be right. Similarly, even when I was able to split the double-double, um, the resolution is highly dependent on the collimation, which is kind of self-evident. Um, and yet at this speed, it's, it's, it's a real kind of takeaway that collimation um, isn't, isn't just a fire and forget thing um, on a scope like this. It, it needs to be tweaked. And, and again, in, in my circumstance where I don't have the luxury of any kind of permanent installation, wherever I go, I have to carry Artemis with me and put it in a car and that sort of thing. So invariably, I'm going to be collimating a lot, um, at least tweaking the collimation. Because, you know, when I was able to split the double-double, I just tweaked the collimation a wee bit and, and I'm able to unsplit it <laughs> just as easily. So, um, so collimation is super important. So at this point, I've got it working. It's silvered. And so um, I'm still working on a number of enhancements on, on the scope. Um, I mentioned collimation, so I want to improve how I do the collimation. I want to have better control over, over the screws, um, and, uh, and I want to change the way the edge support works so that it's on roller bearings to, um, so that it doesn't stick on the Teflon, which I have found to be the case in some cases. Um, and then the other thing that I'm currently enhancing is the secondary hub, which is a mostly aesthetic thing that um, I, you know, I want to get a, a nicer looking secondary hub. I, I've just, I've designed a 3D printed one. 
um, that uh, is right here, actually. Um, so I've 3D printed a new secondary hub that allows me to um, change the offset, the secondary offset even though you know, once I've got it set, it's unlikely that I'm gonna to want to change it to something different, but it does allow me to play with it a little bit. Um, but it's also 3D printed. And so it's, um, it's as stiff as my original secondary hub that I had just sort of cobbled together with dowel and a piece of oak, um, but, uh, but it's also substantially lighter, um, which, was, which is something that I wanted to achieve. Um, and it, 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 I would just want to say, and one of the reasons that I'm showing this is that, in my opinion, 3D printing is enabling a bunch of huge innovations in ATM. Um, uh, Jerry mentioned yesterday the, uh, you know, his uh, helical focuser, 3D printed. I think, you know, this is going to really open a lot of doors to making really cool parts, um, you know, for scopes, and uh, and so it's pretty exciting. And so and. For this particular part of this project, again, I, I have to give some shout outs to other giants like Robert Asimendi, who, who also did the helical focuser for Jerry, Dale Eason, Bertold hum Hamburger. Um, they, they've all been very, very helpful in, in my 3D printing odyssey as a part of this project. So to dial it kind of back to the Altaz initiative and what I think this particular project has as impact, um, I think one of the one of the important impacts is that it's another meniscus mirror success story that's not built by Mel, and that's and that's said with tremendous amount of respect. But he just makes it look so freaking easy, you know that that anyone that can that can do it and replicate his results, I think, is a is a is a step forward because it shows that it's not just it 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 doesn't have to be in the hands of an Uber expert like Mel, but that other people can do it too. So I I I, fi I find uh, I'm I'm happy to be the the guinea pig to try and create a success story with a thin meniscus mirror. Um, another contribution that, that I, I would like to make more of um, is to simplify the slumping process. Um, I've slumped a number of other mirrors now for other people, and, um, and I'd like to get to the point where it's a whole lot easier to slump. Um, one person in particular is having a heck of a time trying to get a form made that's going to go into my kiln. And, and anything that I can do to kind of streamline that process, I think is a good thing. Um, I also want to change the whole kiln controller business because you know the 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 controller that I've got is is just such a such an arcane piece of electronics that is just begging to be um, you know uh, changed over to be Arduino based. Um, and then the other thing that I want to do, uh, and this kind of goes back to this function equals form thing, is that you know the design of this thing is is cool looking, and everyone that looks at it or sees it, you know, thinks it's really kind of neat. And so I want to start to get to the point where I am doing outreach in my neighborhood in particular, you know, a lot of kids in this neighborhood and, you know, and just reaching out to them and, and showing them, you know, what a telescope looks like, how it works, what you can see with it, and hopefully inspiring one or two, um, you know, one or two kids to go down the ATM path or go down the astronomy path or whatever. So hopefully, you know, by, by showing them a telescope like this, it might give them um, that kind of, um, feeling of, you know, this is something that they want to do. And that's the end of my presentation. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Excellent, Tom. Uh, really impressive. Really impressive. Um, so I, just to start off the questions, um, maybe a point of clarification. And in, in all your launching gram, there is this kind of un, uneven thin line going so yeah, I did. Yeah, I did forget to mention that, and I should have done that at the outset because I'm sure everyone was wondering what the heck that is. Um, yeah, like that thin line is a piece of wire. So on my test stand, I do have a wire that that keeps the mirror from tipping out. Um, and I can let me just go back to. Am I still sharing or not? No, you stopped no. sharing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so now you can see my screen. Yeah. So if we go to uh, yeah, so this line here is actually a piece of wire on my test stand. So it's not a crack in the mirror. And, and some of these images too, this, this, this is where the supports are on my test stand. So the, those are not artifacts on the mirror. 
Okay. Uh, this, however, I... this, however, is an artifact in the mirror, and you can see it a little bit in the shadowgram here, but it shows up very clearly in the rockygram. So, so that, that brings me to my, my, my question then. For your edge supports on, on both the Testian and in Artemis itself, you, the, the mirror is resting on two points that are 90 degrees opposite. Is that right. correct? Right. Let me just see if I've got uh, one of these pictures should be. Well, you can sort of see it here. Um, so here's a piece of Teflon and there's a, another piece of Teflon here. And so this is um, 90 degrees apart. Oop, I say you, your, your image hasn't changed on, on my screen. Oh, I'm not sure. Oh. oh, okay. Sorry, I guess let me stop sharing and share my desktop instead. Okay, can you see? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So this, so this, um, so this piece of Teflon here, and there's another piece of Teflon here, and this is separated by ninety degrees. So these are the edge supports. So the collimation, um, you know, is from behind, obviously, and it pushes the mirror forward and back. And so I do find that it sticks a little bit on the Teflon. Um, so when I am collimating, I either have to have the altitude fairly high or I need to just kind of push down the center of the mirror to make sure that it's seated against the, uh, the uh, collimation bolts. Mm, okay. And how, how many uh, support points are on the back? So the support is, um, let's see if we've got a good, good image of that. Um, Multigrams. There, you can see it here. Ah, so sure. basically it's uh, nine points. Um, so three collimation bolts and each one is a triangle with, uh, with three support points. And these are just furniture glides. Mm. Yeah, okay, all right. And how, how thick is the mirror? The mirror is a little over a half inch thick. Ah, okay. There are a couple of chats here. Uh, hey, Tom? <laughs> yes. Uh, what's the weight of your mirror and the weight of the rest of the scope? So the mirror uh, is about seven pounds. And uh, the overall scope, um, I haven't weighed it, so I can't say for sure. Um, yeah, I would, I would only be guessing. Um, so I, I, can't, I can't say for sure how, how much the overall scope weighs. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, there, there, there's a number of, of, uh, of um, comments in the chat section. And uh, Arkash, Arkash is, is saying that, uh, is asking, is breaking a mirror a rite of passage in ATM? Evidently, yeah. <laughs> Evidently. So no wonder he's ever been able to get into it. Rob says yeah. there has to be a better way. Jerry this... says your people say break a leg. Yeah. There's a way to wish somebody good luck. Maybe we should be saying break a mirror. This is the infamous. <laughs> break a mirror. Uh, yeah. You can break yeah. a lens too. That counts. Yeah. yeah. This yeah. is the yeah. infamous <laughs> test rig here. Um, so there's no there's no tip clip here. And so when this end came down, this glass came out. So, yeah, very sad. Um, very sad. Um, so here's, here's a close-up. Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Okay, I just wanted to um, kind of second everything you said uh, about the W stroke. I was copying you um, on that extreme W uh, at the time when I was doing mine, and it was very effective, even though I did have good results at one point with a, a uh, spider lap, um, I found myself feeling like I had the control I wanted with the, the W as you were doing. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, I think by hand, it's, it's the way to go. Um, if I had a machine though, I, I mean, I still, I still have, um, I still believe that that well, I mean, obviously, the way Mel's doing it works, right? And and I, I, I it makes a lot of intuitive sense to me to have just a simple center over center stroke with a spider lap if you have a machine that's doing the work, and you know, and and the benefit of that is because the spider lap is necessarily because of the the the, the very small contact area because the spider legs are very thin, 
um, you know, it's going to take a long time. So if you have a machine, long time, so what? You know, you, the, the machine's doing all the work. And, and so, you know, it's, it's that trade-off. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I believe that with a machine, the spider still might be the better way to go. Um, but by hand, it was just every time I tried it in all of my figuring runs, whether it was a spider or a pedal lap, any kind of shaped lap, it was just inducing artifacts that I just, you know, I just would shake my head and, and give up, um, you know, and, and wonder why I, you know, I even, I even tried it. <laughs> um, now, one of the things, um, you know, that, that I, like, I've been really interested in this whole Elvira clutch thing. Um, and, and, in, and indeed, you know, what Jerry was, was doing with his clutching as well, because, you know, the, um, when, when you've got um, the P2 on here, a um, 100 degree, um, 20 millimeter um, Explorer Scientific eyepiece, um, as well as the focuser um, and the Rigel, you know, it's, it's very heavy up here. And the, the way the, the weight kind of shifts when it's up at um, near zenith, um, it actually starts to drift down. So generally it's balanced really, really well. Like in this position, obviously it, it's holding this position, but if I were to go up in altitude a little bit more and I let go, it would actually slide down. And it's got to do with basically the asymmetry of, um, you know, of the design. So it's, it's, you know, there's no stuff up here. And so once this thing tips past the other side, th there's, there, there isn't offsetting weight. And so as a result, this really needs to have some simple kind of clutching um, integrated into it so that mm -hmm. when I am switching eyepieces or even just at a super high altitude, I can just kind of um, tighten it a little bit and keep it in place. Um, I think maybe some kind of electronic actuator might be a little bit of overkill for this. Um, so I'm kind of leaning towards the more simplistic uh, design that Jerry's got. But, um, but yeah, I, I, need to, uh, I need to somehow solve the slipping problem. Um, Actually, uh, there was a, oops, sorry. At the Oregon Stir Party that um, implemented a non-circular altitude bearing. It had kind of an elliptical shape. Or something funny and the idea was that um as you tip the scope up and down it moves the, the CG. um CG so that it's always in the right place yeah yeah um, i actually do that with this i've seen that on a new, new moon had a few scopes that they did that the elliptical bearings with and i've used one and it worked really well i think it was a, a 14 inch but the problem with the elliptical bearing is that they couldn't, the, the, the reason they stopped doing it was it was annoying to manufacture and they couldn't put an encoder on it for digital setting circles anymore. Um, yeah, like my 14 has a similar problem to what yours is doing, Tom, and mine has stuff in the middle. I think it's just anything that with, where the whole tube is gonna, is weighing like, you know, only a few times more than the eyepiece in Paracore, you're gonna have this problem of it wanting to, yeah. mine gets yanked up I think is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, like if you look at it here, you know, and so, the, so the, the, the center of gravity is here somewhere. And, and so you've got a bunch of stuff over here and a bunch of stuff over here. So it's somewhat balanced around the center point, but once it's up, then basically you just have this on the other side of the center. The mirror basically is a wash because it's, it's sort of balanced across the center. And then you've got all of this wood here on this side. So it's basically the weight of this wood that's pulling it down. So if I wanted to balance it better, I would need to maybe have a counterweight perhaps up here, you know, that helps keep it balanced when the bulk of the, the, wood, the wood is on the one side of the center and, and there's very little on the other um, or, or, or clutch it or springs. Yeah, that'll definitely work. Springs will work too. I'm just thinking for mine, a little clutch like what Jerry had in his travel scope, because I only get it when I'm like within 10 degrees or so of the zenith and it's exactly to a swing. My, with mine, the eyepiece is it's getting yanked in the direction of the eyepiece. And so what I what I do to kind of counteract it is mine's on a, an equatorial platform. So I set the equatorial platform so that it's near the end of its travel, whatever the opposite direction of my eyepiece is, because it, otherwise it just wants to swing up. And it's it's really it's really annoying. Um, yeah. Especially with the 20 when he does. Right. It's less I hate to see you ruin the simplicity and elegance um, 
with a clutch and or springs or all that and you know that elliptical thing if, if you're not going to put encoders on it you're going to do a platform uh anyway just a suggestion Ellip that elliptical sure does work <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah but this this was a lot of woodwork to, to get to this point, yeah. you know, so to make, to make another set of, um, another frame and whatnot, you know, that, that would be a non-trivial job as well. And, and I do, sure. I, I did, I didn't mention it out loud, but I did have it on my slide that, um, an equatorial platform is definitely, uh, in the cards for this as well. Just, just a word of, from, uh, experience here, Tom, you know, putting some weight, some counterweight on the, in the picture here would be on top of the, uh, the mirror box, like you indicated. Will definitely work yeah and you probably won't need very much because the the scope is already balanced in, in this configuration mm -hmm. so you, you might need maybe five pounds you know, yeah five kilos. yeah i think yeah. less I, I i've i've tried to measure it and i think it's like uh i needed like a i think i need like a pound of torque to, that, to offset the eyepiece enough to go. get it to stop moving it's not going right. to make it perfectly even motions but it won't move yeah, that's all I care about. I'm going to zenith. But from an aesthetic standpoint, I don't want, you know, lead weights on the top here. So I would want to kind of tuck them underneath inside of the mirror box. And then is there any danger of weights dropping off and hitting the mirror? You could bolt um, it to the side of the box with some little wood screws. Yeah, just, just use, use uh... lead bag, like a lead shop bag in the corner and mm -hmm. like glue, like have a screw to go through the mesh that would work. Yeah. Um, I was just uh, thinking about this encoder thing. Um, if you put <clears throat> the encoder shaft on a pendulum, it wasn't connected to, to anything. You just let gravity do the work. Then it wouldn't matter that it was shaped funny. I, I'm pretty sure I'm right about totally. that. Yeah. And you could put it anywhere. Yeah. Hey, try question. Um, one thing I've done a lot with my super light telescopes is used composites and you'll find that uh, i hope that these will be worked more into atm telescopes and that weight of the wood disappears because the composites using like nomex uh, are so light that your balance points become much less critical mm -hmm. so that's just another aspect to think about um, moving into different materials like nomex and you know carbon fiber over these cellular structures or even 3d printing can become very light materials yeah and it also adds a huge um growth area for ATMs. definitely yeah definitely although you know i guess you know if all of this were carbon fiber let's say um you know th then but you'd still have a balance issue because and you'd have less things to kind of have at your disposal to tweak because I, you know, I could theoretically drill out some of this wood, like, you know, in Mel Zipdog, for example, you know, he's got some weight saving holes cut into his J arms, um, you know, because it doesn't affect the structure, but it, it does save some weight. And so if all of this were essentially zero weight because it was, you know, carbon fiber, let's say, you know, then, then you wouldn't, then you'd have a when you have a harder balance problem because then you've got these discrete weights like the mirror like this up here and this up here and the secondary that you don't really have any kind of way of finessing any balance around it so they it, wouldn't that make the problem worse um i'm from my I, I just want to say that in in the future, it, somebody who undertakes a job like this um, would really be served well by doing it in CAD and doing the uh, CG calculations with all the materials properly, yeah. you know, uh, assigned. Yeah. That helps a lot. Um, and, but, and, and anyway. frankly, you know, and, and this was because, the you know, the design, the original, um, Mel helped, pardon me, Mel helped me um, do the original design in SketchUp. And then, and then I tweaked it from there. So, but, but that was a learning curve for me um, using SketchUp. And I don't know sure. whether SketchUp actually has any sort of CG stuff for all of my 3D printing. I'm now getting up to speed in Fusion 360, which I know does have all of that kind of thing in it. Um, but yeah, but it's such a huge learning curve. So um, yeah, it, it would be a good idea, but 
Getting back to the notion of composites for a second, the concern I would have would be that it, I think I think you what you were saying, Thomas. Like if you the the secondary and primary are basically they're centered along the center of gravity of the scope and everything. The problem with this big eyepiece focus or paracore combination is it's it's act it's outside of the tube and it's yanking on it in a non in a direction that's not ninety it's not like a ninety degree relation to the rest of the tube. So if you made the whole tube lighter, if you made the whole structure of the telescope lighter, the offset of the center of gravity is going to move further outside the center of the scope and you're going to have worse problems with it wanting to move of its own accord up up and down and what, depending on the weight of the paracore and eyepiece because mm -hmm. you have because the center of mass isn't being shifted back to the middle. Whereas if you have a really heavy upper tube assembly, you know, as we do with these bit with the bigger scopes, um, you can stick five pounds of stuff on the focuser and the motions aren't going to do anything because you're, that's not, you know, that's like less than half of the weight of the upper tube. But on this, the upper tube is weighing, the upper air tube of the scope weighs nothing at all. So when you stick three pounds of accessories on it, boom, the center of gravity is now somewhere like close to the edge of it. Right. Yes. Uh, hey, Tom? <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so on one of my scopes, I needed a break. And the brake disc I used was actually a piece of, um, of plastic, just, uh, uh, you know, something I got from the scrap bin at the plastics house. But I've also used uh, high density polyurethane, which is normally you think of as being real slick. You put a little pressure on it, it provides a nice, really nice, smooth uh, friction point. Mm -hmm. So you, by changing the different, um, plexiglass or uh, high density polyurethane or Teflon or the hundred other uh, polys out there, you can kind of adjust the friction level. Yeah. It, it wouldn't take much, just a, an inch or two of pad um, down at the right hand point of the J contact on each side pushing out would give you, yeah, you know, might, might be all you need. Yeah. So here's the other challenge is that this is basically a flex rocker. Um, you know, like Mel's got in, in all of his designs. So this, this piece of wood here is very thin and very flexible. So if I were to basically have some sort of a screw kind of clutch thing, you know, like Jerry's got using a material like you're talking about, Greg, um, here, you know, I don't know that it would necessarily give enough friction because it would just basically push this flex rocker outward as opposed to, you know, compressing against the J. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it there. Um, if you've moved to the right where the triangle is, yeah, yeah. I'd put it, I'd put it on the inside of that. Mm -hmm. I put one, and I'd put one on each side. So it mm -hmm. just kind of pushed out, pushed out against the, the inside of the J. And then on the inside of the J, you might want a little matching strip of some other material so you don't wear your wood mm -hmm. you know it's but like um, well more more like just a, a, a break a strip to a wear strip so it, it's the same as the base you know you put you put the uh, formica down and then run teflon against it it's the same concept except you're just adjusting the materials to get a little more friction right yeah anyway, that's all i had uh, okay. Tom, uh, do, do, do you remember? Take, take one more. Okay, Tom, do you remember? Uh, I don't know if you saw it a couple months ago. I put together a, a little design on OSW uh, forum. Uh, Mel and I were kind of bantering back and forth on a mechanical clutch design. Um, I put together one that was um, actually had your kind of your scope in mind because it was uh, very discreet, uh, all mechanical, no electronics in, involved. Could be used in alt or alt as mode, uh, and it um, takes care of just about everything that you're you're talking about. It allows the scope to be massively imbalanced because of eyepiece changes. You could have a, a five millimeter plossel in there, uh, you know, one minute, and you could have your paracore and uh, and a big uh, you know uh, uh, thirty one millimeter or whatever uh, hanging on there. Uh, so you can have massive weight changes and your hand just takes care of the uh the uh automatically when you grasp a handle the the uh, the weight change and the scope would never tip over because uh you, your hand uh when you take your hand off the handle uh it, the it scope locks. locks yeah yeah I, I vaguely locks. recall that and and i remember yeah. I, I did mentally bookmark it um but i'm, I'm glad you you mentioned it again because yeah. i'm going to go back and, and look at it um i kind of had i kind of had your scope in mind when yeah. i was uh, thinking about that yeah. 
and uh, yeah. And I also grab my upper ring to move it around <laughs> per the discussion that, that's going on, <laughs> you know, but a, but a handle, a handle would be nice. And people, you know, people that are using this ask, you know, where, where to grab it and what to do. Now, actually I, sometimes I grab it here, but then sometimes I'm actually using my fingers to, to push against this bearing to, you know, to do some of the tracking. And then, and then I can also just adjust it up and down here with my fingers when I'm kind of tracking things with my, manual equatorial platform. Um, right. You, yeah. In this case, you would uh, try to adjust those um, bearing points, uh, the Teflon or whatever, for a lower uh, level of friction and then allow the clutch to take care of the rest. Mm -hmm. And then you, then you may not have to press on other points of the scope. You could yeah. do it all from the handle. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I'll definitely uh, look at that again. Okay. I think we've, we've had a really good discussion. We, we've run by on time. Um, we don't want to squeeze Richard's um, talk nope, definitely too much. Not. And um, so we can continue these ideas on the OSW list, um, or you can write more com uh, comments in the, uh, the chat that uh, we can capture that way. So, um, okay. So thank you very much, Tom. I'm so glad you accepted my invitation to talk about Artemis. I think it was um, very well done and, and, and very useful for a lot of people. Thank you. So Richard, you everyone. Richard, you're, you're up um, okay. and you're going to tell us about the science capability of the Unistellar EV scope. That's right. And I, I just wanted to say the, the aesthetics of these fast scopes, absolutely stunning. I, I really like them. Um, but that's not where I've been going these years. Um, all F5, here we go. Um, what I'm gonna talk about this evening is the science capabilities. Um, oops, not showing right, is it? Nope. Hang on, we'll just, I have a, I'm gonna stop the share. I'm gonna start it. I'm gonna get the right. Okay. Oops, I got it reversed. Hang on. That's that's the Oh, it's good here. Oops. Hang on, I'll get it. All right, then. Moon, we have a black screen. Ah, there it is. Okay. Looks good. Uh, the technology is always challenging. Um oops. Let's see. When you share, you have a multitude of possibilities for what you can share. Okay, so this should work. But why am I seeing me? Okay, now now we see your, your presentation with your presentation view on the left. Wait a minute, I'm, okay, I'm looking at the Zoom channel, which should be sh showing, okay. Okay, it's caught up. There seems to be a lag or something. Okay. Sorry, you're not looking at the uh, live stream on YouTube, are you? Oh, that's, that's, that's on the other computer. That's okay. my sanity check to make sure. <laughs> but okay. I'm getting the right thing. Um, but that clearly is not working quite right. Okay, so back to step one. Verify. Oh, I've got, okay, too many things running all at the same time. And it worked perfectly a few minutes ago. So this uh, of is- Of course, yeah, wow. Of course, right? Okay, so. All right, that is working. And oops, now I got more open windows so you can shake a stick at. That should be it. 
Okay. And now I should be able to do Alt F5. Hmm. Now my email is popping up. Okay, you're looking at the, no, we're not looking at that. Hey, that looks like a pretty darn good cup of coffee. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's one of those standard presentations. Okay. <laughs> Gonna maximize the darn thing. I'm gonna move the little bar. Slideshow. Come on. <clears throat> uh, Rich, oh, there you go. Now it's full screen. Looks great. Everyone wants a cup of coffee. All right. So what I want to talk about tonight um, is the unicellular EV scope, which comes in three varieties now. The original EV scope, the Equinox scope, and the EV scope 2. These scopes are alt azimuth telescopes. And if we had if we time warp one of these things back to our earlier meetings, we would have gone, holy cow, this is what we wanted to do. It's an alt azimuth telescope that uses plate solving to navigate its way around the sky. And it delivers an image, um, in this case, to an eyepiece on the side of the telescope, which is actually a an, um, OLED screen or to a controlling um, uh, cell phone. The algorithms that process the data coming off of here make it possible to observe in horrible conditions. Okay, this is a parking lot that's brightly lit. This is exactly what you often encounter at a public star party. In order to make it safe for people to go to it, you can't see the sky. What they do is that they have very good algorithms that remove the sky background effectively. And so in very bright skies, you can do very good observing. Okay, so here's, here's what we're looking at optically. All of the scopes are 114 millimeter aperture and everybody says you can't do anything with a telescope that small. And the answer is yes, you can, because I'm looking to do what you can do with science. Focal length is all the same. It's a parabolic F4 mirror. Um, the sensor in the EV scope and Equinox is six millimeters across the diagonal. The sensor in the EV scope two is nine millimeters across the diagonal. Um, it's a finer pitch, um, a pixel pitch in the EV scope two. Um, and because it's a larger sensor, you have a larger field size. And the data that's coming off of the sensor is stored on board. And in the Equinox and EV Scope 2, you have 64 gigabytes of online storage that's on the telescope. Okay, now the OTA is carried on a motorized ALTAS mount. Um, when you turn the instrument on, um, okay, <laughs> you turn the switch on it, and that's the last time you have to touch the machine. You can then walk away 75 feet away. The telescope becomes a Wi-Fi hotspot. Your cell phone, now you log on to it with your cell phone, and you're looking at what the telescope does. You use the joystick controls to move it away from pointing straight up at the zenith, and then say, okay, find yourself. It takes an image. It's default at this time is running half second exposures. And so it's seeing stars down to about 10th, 11th magnitude. It does a plate solution. It moves, does another plate solution. And then says, what do you want to look at? Okay, at that point, you can either use one of its menus to pick one of the standard couple thousand objects in their, in their uh, uh, onboard uh, data, 
or you can enter a right ascension and declination of your own. At that point, the telescope typically takes three steps to reach the, the, the object you want to look at. And in the final step, the object is in the field and then it will move over and there'll be another plate solution and it'll be centered, okay? Um, this is actually very, very similar to the logical um, methods that um, uh, we were uh, talking about last night. Um, so you're using the telescope to find its own way. At that, at that point, you can turn on what they call enhanced vision, um, which is automatic tracking, image derotation, and stacking. So every four seconds at this point, you're taking another image, you're plate solving it again, you're derotating it, and you're stacking it. So the basic four second exposure is grainy, of course. And then as you begin to accumulate more images, which happens automatically and quite fast, within 30 seconds, you're looking at a decent image. Within a minute, you're looking at quite a good image. Um, and if you, and you say, well, you know, what can you do with this? Well, you can click and save an image uh, as a PNG or a JPEG. Um, but if you want to do science, which is what I wanted to do, you upload your raw data to Unistellar. They send you a link and you download all the FITS images that you took. Um, okay, so imaging. What, what kind of science can you do um, with imaging? Well, there's a lot more than you think of it. Of course, the AVSO has for many, many years uh, done visual um, uh, <laughs> sorry I, I was just confused I looked over and the zoom is running several seconds behind the uh, the screen that I'm currently showing okay there's like about a four second lag that's that's odd okay um, where the human being looks into the eyepiece of his telescope with a chart star is brighter and dimmer than the star you're trying to measure or trying to, to estimate. And you say, well, okay, it's brighter than this and fainter than this. This star is nine, this star is 12. It's halfway in between. And you, this is how variable star estimating was done for many years, for about 70, 80 years. Okay, well, now you have a 114 millimeter telescope that within a minute or so is showing you 16th magnitude stars, which is about what you see in a 14 inch telescope with a 250 power eyepiece. Um, and so this is like five minutes of light accumulation. Since you can go to any right ascension or declination you want to, you can do the same kind of simple eyeball estimates of how bright a star is. Now, this star is V405 um, Origi, which is um, one of these stars that erupts and does all sorts of weird stuff. It has a very short rotational period, um, which you can't see with this because you're, you're, you're not. But it also goes up and down, and it sometimes erupts and becomes real bright. So I've, the, the star is circled. Um, and using a, a chart, which you could get from the AVSO, you can say, well, it's brighter than 13.5, dimmer than 10.1, little dimmer maybe than 13.0, so maybe it's about 13.2. And that's, you can do that within five minutes of putting the telescope down outside, turning on your cell phone and saying, okay, type in the coordinates, five hours, 57 minutes, 15 seconds, and the telescope goes to it. So you can do, there's, we have now a capability to do almost instant variable star estimation, or you can capture the images and you can do photometry on these images. And I'll be talking about photometry in a few minutes because this is digital data that you can process. 
And of course, when, when you get tired of looking at boring variable stars, um, you can look at pretty things. This is this is what you see on the Omega Nebula after th three minutes. Um, uh, a lot of the uh, users right now are running exposures in the range of 20 to 30 minutes, and the image gets better. The, the graininess in the background goes away. Um, to me, this looks pretty good for a three-minute exposure that I didn't have to do any work for. Um, and you can just cruise around the sky doing this kind of stuff. At public star parties, this is awesome because the image in the eyepiece or the image on the cell phone is not so bright that it completely deprives you of your night vision. And yet in that bright parking lot kind of environment, the public can see this. And I, you know, I've did a lot of public star nights and I know that those people would look into the eyepiece and they would see a faint blob and just to be nice they'd say yeah I see it <laughs> they were not impressed M13 was not doing anything for them um, which is sad okay so photometry which is the art of measuring the brightness of stars Okay, and this is one of the, the, the fundamental things that astronomers do. Okay, you look at stars and you figure out how they work. Okay, so this was a test run. Uh, the, I, I really wanted to see how this little, little scope, this seemingly trivial scope could do measuring um, stuff that I had done with the bigger telescopes. I, used, um, oh, on this particular star, I'd have done a lot of observations with an eight inch telescope and an 11 inch telescope and a 14 inch telescope. And um, it's actually also the star that um, uh, Dan's lollipop telescope followed for three nights and shot 5,000 observations of way back at, at Pine Mountain Observatory back in the old days. So Dan may even remember this star fondly. Um, and he was shooting 15 second exposures and he just, it was wonderful. Yeah, it, Huge was a, of data. it was a very fun night. Yeah, so I mean, here's that star and it's still doing its thing. Every three hours and 14 minutes, it goes up and down, up and down. Now there's, what's interesting about the science is that this star's period is changing. Okay, and if you observe it over many years, you can see how much it's changing. And if part of the reason that, that it may be changing is it's in a binary system, uh, it may be moving toward us or away from us and that may be causing the change. Or if the star is evolving, that may be causing the change. And so what you wanna do is you wanna look at these things over years. This star has more than 100 years of observations. One of the early observers was Harlow Shapley. Um, and for amateurs, it's beautiful, straight overhead in Cygnus. Okay, so here's the star. In the middle of Cygnus, it looks like every other star. Okay, so on three successive nights, I made a set of, I, I pointed the EV scope at this field, and I shot an hour and a quarter of, EV, of, of this star. Then I started it again and shot another hour and a quarter of the star. And then I started again and shot another uh, hour and a quarter. The reason I did three separate runs was I was just antsy that something would go wrong and I'd lose everything. So I thought, well, if I do it separate small chunks, I won't lose everything all at once. Um, and everything worked perfectly. I uploaded the data Unistellar, um, sent a message and said, please send me the link. They sent it to me. I downloaded six gigabytes of data, 3,300 images. Because remember, the EV scope is taking an image every four seconds <laughs> for three and a half hours, the 3,300 images. Okay. I wish it would do longer exposures, but it doesn't. Um, okay, so here's the first image queued up. Um, 
in AIP for Winds multi image photometry. Uh, I've marked the V star, the variable, C1, which is a comp star. It's a, mag a star whose magnitude we know. And C2 is another star. We don't have to know its magnitude, but what we're worried about, we're going to compare the V and C1. Okay. And C1 is supposedly doesn't change. But we don't trust it so much. We're going to look at C2 and we're going to take the difference between these two stars and the difference between these two stars. This is just a sanity check, basically. Okay, so we look at the image up real close. The sensor in the EV scope is a Bayer uh, matrix sensor. So it means that it's got red, green, green, and blue um, pixels all lined up against one another. That's not optimally good for doing photometry because the star can wander around on two different pixels, but you'll see that the stars are big enough that that's going to average out. So what you do when you do photometry is you tote up all of the signal in, this, in the center, then you measure the average signal of the sky background. You uh, normalize that and take it off. And that gives you the brightness of the star in pixel values, which you then convert into magnitude. Okay, so when you reduce your data, you end up with a spreadsheet that has 3,300 lines. And in the first column is a Julian Day. In order to make it more plottable, I simply removed the, the Julian Day fraction. Then you have two values here. You have the variable star minus C1, okay? If C1 is constant, the variable star changes, this number is gonna change. And then you have C2 minus C1. If the, very, if, if the two stars stay the same, this value will remain constant. Now there's noise in the system. So you can see this value is bouncing around and we don't have enough of a data run here to see much change. So here's what happens when you plot 3,300 data points. Okay, it's noisy, um, but the blue spots are magnitude estimates, the difference between the C1 star and the variable. And then because it looks so messy, I simply ran a, uh, mo a moving average of 10, 10 points. And you can see it's reasonably clean. If you did a little bit more averaging, it would get smooth. And this is the difference between C2 and C1. And you can see that yeah, it's noisy, but it basically doesn't drift. That tells me that the data is okay. Now, what I was looking to get was the time at which this star reached its very brightest point. And if you just eyeball these points, you say, well, ah, you'd never figure that out. But what I did here is to fit a six order polynomial and the position of the, the polynomial depends on several hundred data points. So it's going to average out a lot of the irregularity. Um, here's the <laughs> six order polynomial. You figure out what's this point, what is the highest value on that curve? And that turns out to be at Julian day 2459375.79681, which is less than a minute. Okay, and if you do statistics on stuff like this, you find out you're really as good as a minute, a determination of something that is uh, has a period of three hours and 14 minutes. So you can do real science, okay? And this these data can be co combined with other people's data um, because it's good data. And the beautiful thing is I put the telescope outside, shot a dark frame, queued up the star, uncapped the scope, right? I shot a dark frame, so I have to uncap the scope. Then went inside and watched things happening properly um, with the uh, my cell phone on the dining room table. I come back every 10 or 20 minutes to check that everything was running right. This is the way to do science when you want to accumulate a lot of data. Okay, so 
astrometry, which is measuring the art of measuring where things are in the sky. Well, Barnard's star is a fast moving star. Um, it's only six light years away and it's trucking along 10 arc seconds a year going this way. Okay, it, it's cycled. It's really easy to find visually in a telescope because it has this <laughs> incredibly obvious arrow pointing. Um, so, and it's been moving steadily around. If you look at pictures in old textbooks, it was down here. Okay, so this, this star is really moving out. Well, this was just a challenge to find out whether I could measure with this little scope, uh, the motion of Barnard's star in um, one month. Now you could also do things like measure the positions of asteroids, all kinds of projects can be done. Um, and Dave Rowe was talking about this kind of stuff um, by measuring the positions of objects. Okay, so I used Dave Rowe's plate solve uh, to do the analysis. Um, plop the image in, um, push plate solve, and it comes up with the center coordinates of the, the image. It also gives you the coordinates of, okay, so here the red crosses are the stars that is detected in the image, and the blue crosses are the locations of reference stars. These come from the Gaia catalog. Okay, or for UCAC or from UCAC 5, which is another astromagic catalog. And you'll notice that Barnard's star is not a Gaia star because it's moving too fast. Okay, it's one of the things you look at, it's not a stationary reference star. And Dave's program will dump out these data for each of the images you take. Okay, so you queue it up and you shoot and you get output like this for here's all the stars these are the Gaia numbers gives you the centroids and stuff like that but here's the key thing um, it has found the right ascension and declination precision solved them for every star in the image and this one is Barnard's star first of all it's in the right spot so you now know that in this for this image um, it's 17 hours, 57 minutes, 47.317, um, plus or minus some small amount. And the declination is plus 4 degrees, 45 minutes, 20.31, plus or minus some small unknown amount. Okay, well, I ran on September 5th. I did, I just uh, accumulated data for two minutes. Uh, which is 31 images because doing 15 images a minute. And this is the coordinate we came up with. Um, and, and this is the number you note, uh, 20.37, October 2nd, okay, we come up with 21.41. The difference is 1.05 arc seconds. Um, and in right ascension, it moved minus 0.23 arc seconds. The expected values were different. I mean, we, we disagree by um, something on the order of a tenth of an arc second. It's considering that we invested all of 11 minutes of observing time um, in making this determination. We have seen the fastest moving star in the sky move in, um, move measurably well outside of any errors. Um, in one month. Um, using an eight inch telescope several years ago, I found that I could find, determine the motion of Barnard's star from one night to the next, which is kind of scary. Okay. Um, so this could have been an asteroid. It could have been any number of other things whose positions we wanted to measure precisely. Um, and as long as they're brighter than about 12th or 13th magnitude, um, you're good to go. Okay, so this this slide summarizes the science capabilities. Um, you get a 1.3 megapixel 12-bit image. Um, you can auto-locate the field centers. The telescope 
auto tracks and derotates, which means that once you're sitting on something, you can forget about it. The telescope is taking care of that. It's, it's navigating on its own. And then you can get all of the original data that the telescope collected simply by asking for it. Um, a lot of us would love to see the telescope controlled, not by a cell phone, but by a PC so that we would get the data immediately because it takes about four or five days and you always get your you always ask for your data friday and of course they take the weekends off so you don't get a message back until tuesday that here's the link and you can download your six gigabytes of data photometry visually looking at your cell phone screen you're looking at 16 16th magnitude in 60 seconds and in you know, five minutes or something like that, you're looking at 17th magnitude, um, which means you can see a lot of stuff with your little telescope that you can't see through a big telescope. Um, exposure times, which are controllable, um, 10 milliseconds, 3.9, 3.9 seconds as long as it goes, you can actually go into the microsecond range. Uh, there's not a whole lot of stars that are bright enough to see in microseconds, um, but you can, in fact, you want, you actually have to go down to microseconds range to look at bright things like the moon. Uh, it takes a new image every 3972 milliseconds. Uh, that's four seconds in round numbers. And what you get out of it is a Bayer matrix raw image, which is not ideal at all for doing photometry. But what it means though, is that you have a red, a green and a blue determination of magnitude from each raw image. And then finally for astrometry, um, uh, your scale is 1.70, 1 1.718 arc seconds per pixel, which means that you can't resolve much in terms of detail. Um, you can do astrometry about one arc second in, four, in a single four second exposure. And if you combine a lot of exposures together, um, in about 10 minutes, you can get data, which is good to about um, 80 milli arc seconds. Um, so that's, that is basically what I've been up to. Uh, <laughs> this is a fun telescope. The thing that bothers people, I think sometimes that it's not cheap. Um, it, the, the, the EV scope costs $3,000. Um, I was lucky because I got in early when they were offering it for $1,600 if you buy in early. And I said, hey, where else am I going to see alt as technology applied this way for a mere $1,600? Um, <laughs> and sometimes it's worth gambling. And sometimes it's worth supporting a new company, which is doing something truly cool. Um, one thing I want to say is the technology these guys are pro pioneering is entirely portable. Okay. I mean, they have a four inch telescope and a tube this long, right? Okay. Oh, the same logic, the same software could deal with a much larger image and a much larger telescope because it's just driving motors, right? And this is not even direct drive motors. These are gear motors. So when you move the telescope, it goes whir, 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 whir. Okay, so somebody has broken the tech barrier and is selling these things and they're selling thousands of them. Um, which And what that means is that there's thousands of observers out there looking for stuff to do with their telescopes. So I, I look at this and I say, hey, this is an opportunity for people who want to do science. Now, the Unistellar company has teamed up with the CD Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence guys, and they are doing asteroid occultations, um, exoplanet transits, and comet tracking as, as citizen science projects. And uh, they've done some neat stuff with this, like they had one 
um, exoplanet transit that the observers in France began the transit and observers in North America picked it up and completed it. Okay. They've also done things like they've had multiple observers observe the same uh, exoplanet transit and then they overlay the curves from the different people and they overlay perfectly. Um, so if you can overlay three observers, you can probably overlay more than that. This is an interesting and different way of doing science, small scale science. Um, and so, you know, that's why, that, that's why I find this exciting. And in keeping with the theme of the uh, PDX 14, it was done with an altazimuth telescope. So, questions? Bravo. Um, so, what? Uh, so, you've always obviously had a lot of fun. And did, did you expect results this good before you started? Um. Well, I've, I've, I've. Let's put it this way. I got a lot of good, fun science kind of stuff out of a 60 millimeter refractor um, uh, with a, a, a QSI camera. So this was going from, from that standpoint, this was a bigger telescope than I've used for doing science before. Um, what, so, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, it's, it's an exciting technology, but there's nothing new, okay? They've combined a, a, you know, a parabolic mirror, a sensor, drive motors, plate solving, Wi-Fi connection, and they put it all together into an integrated package. And, you know, if you tried to reinvent this thing you, and, you, and you paid yourself ten dollars an hour because you're just a tech and you, that's all you can get right you couldn't do this in 300 hours of work um so if you if you it, it it is it is a bargain for what it gives you if you have the money to do it um you can obviously um do you can accomplish much the same stuff at less expensive uh, probably with an eight inch telescope and a fairly good mount and um, a CCD camera and stuff like that. But it won't be as easy to use. And as we've seen, you're going to have wires everywhere. <laughs> and this thing's wireless. It's, it's real fun to use. Yeah. We're, we're, yeah. Your enthusiasm is contagious. Um, um, um. Question, question, a practical question for you, yeah. Richard. Speaking as a board member for the Eugene Astronomical Society, we've been debating whether or not to buy one of these for outreach at our star parties. Uh, after having used one for a while, what do you think? Is it is it worth it for an astronomy club to spend this kind of money on something that we'll use once a month for groups of like 20 to 30 people? Absolutely, I would think, because it's a Wi-Fi hotspot, so you can have, I can't remember if it was eight or 10 people, they can log on to that same site and they can all be looking. You can also transfer control to one of the, you know, if you, if you get a bright eight-year-old kid, of course, who knows how to use the, <laughs> the <laughs> you, do, you can turn over control to the eight-year-old kid and that kid will have a, a ball. Yeah. Um, that might and, be the most worthwhile thing right there, just getting somebody else involved. Yeah, and, and the, the um, you know, there's no reason that the club members can't take it out and, and um, use it for observing parties too. Good point. Now, because, because the uh, Oregon Star Party was canceled, we had a little star party uh, out here. I live in Di Dallas, Oregon now. Um, and um, so we had a group of people meeting out near Monmouth. Um, um, and uh, the guys who had fancy telescope rigs and stuff like that were going like, oh, this is cool. This is cool. Well, it is cool. Um, 
you know, it's, it's, I, I think the, the only thing that we <laughs> probably drives people like telescope makers crazy is that it's a commercial rig that you, you pay money for instead of something you crafted and built yourself. Right. Okay. On the other hand, it opens the possibility well, of doing science. Of YouTube live stream. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you can you can now do science projects that you, you know, would have taken you two years to build up the equipment to do. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can set this thing down and 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 do it. I mean, I'm not kidding. It weighs 20 pounds. So you pick the thing up and carry it out and set it down in the yard. Um, make sure it's level, log on to it, push the go button, and um, you're on. Uh, it would be, it would be, it would be great in a school setting too. And and the cost, anytime you can divide the cost by over ten or twenty people, it becomes, you know, less than an eyepiece. So, Richard, we, there is a series of questions on chat. Thank you. Oh, okay. And uh, I'll just read them off to you one by one, and you can give us a re reply. Sure. So the first one is, uh, for photometry, is the output data real, or is it a construct of photons, electrons, and math to enhance the pretty sky? Um, it's, I mean, it is. I'm not sure what you mean by by not real. You're looking at the raw the raw images that came out of the CMOS sensor. That's what they send you. Okay, so th this has not been stacked or anything like that. What they give you is the raw stuff that they built. Okay, now in the EV scope itself, it's constructing an image. Okay, but it's constructing the image by stacking multiple raw images. Um, so uh, I've I've constructed images um, uh, myself from the raw data. I mean, you saw the the picture of Barnard's star was a color picture I made from the data, and um, all I can say is, boy, their algorithms are good because um, they really know how to subtract bright sky backgrounds. You know, I mean, you you can observe with a full moon in the sky. Uh, we, there's observers on the who are observing from downtown Chicago and stuff like that. And um, the images under real bright skies get noisier than the images under dark skies. Um, and they tend to pick up gradients and other crud because, you know, there's just so much light that the poor stars <laughs> photons have trouble getting through. But yeah, it, it's real data. Okay, so the next question is from the YouTube stream and it's asking regarding the image set that you downloaded for photometry, are they all derotated as you receive them? 16 bit, what info is in the header? Um, it's a fairly standard um, FITS header. Uh, the images are not derotated, they are the raw bare images. Okay, so you've got RGB, RGGB quads. Um, so if you're going to make a, if you're going to do photometry, you're really doing, it's, it's cowboy photometry, right? You're, you're making a, 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 a you're making a, 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 an aperture large enough to encompass the whole thing. Um, and when you're doing this kind of photometry, it's actually desirable to have the stars slightly out of focus so that you have a larger number of pixels involved in the star detection. Okay, well, that kind of goes into the next question. Um, do you have the ability to force the scope to slightly defocus so you can debayer to get TG band photometry? Yes. Um, I, I, can, I can put it, well, <laughs> the focus is a great big knob on the back and um, it comes with a batten off mask, so that's how you focus. I'm um, forwarding questions from YouTube, so that's why. Was I not muted? Uh, you, 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 no, you weren't muted. If... I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So yeah, so basically that was just Arkush saying that he's forwarding questions from the YouTube live stream. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, the, the, the next one is what um, photometry slash plate solving slash image analysis software you're using. Um, you mean me? Yeah. Okay, well, the EV scope has its own built-in stuff. Um, for the photometry, I was using AIP for Windows. Um, that's the software that comes with um, uh, the Handbook of Astronomical Image Processing, which I'm uh, one of the authors. Um, that, by the way, when Wilman Bell went out of business, um, I put this, I created a, um, a uh, groups IO called AIP for Windows dot groups IO. And we're not just giving the software away for free because um, Wilman Bell uh, no longer exists. So there's no way to um, register your images. So it's free, right? Um, and and um, uh, uh, Dave Rose uh, um, astrometry software um, you can get from Dave. Also free. Also free, yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. An amazing so software. Um, I mean, it has these huge, um, uh, what is it about? Total of about four gigabytes of reference star data that you have to bring along with it too. Okay, and the final question is, uh, any thoughts on how to create darks and flats to use when processing your images offline? Or has that already been done to the images you received to download? Um, uh, you, okay, you, you cap the tube and you push the make a make a dark frame button, and it spends about two minutes making a dark frame, and then it says, "Be sure to take the cap off again." <laughs> so, and when you download your data, it comes with a dark frame. Um, so. Uh, you have to do the dark frame subtraction. Uh, you, flat fielding, um, because you have a sensor sitting in the middle of an unvignetted light from the parabolic mirror, the, the, there, there really is no vignetting as such. Um, it would, I have not tried to create flats, but it would be pretty simple. You know, put a, put a sheet of white paper over the front of the telescope and take some pictures of the white ceiling and, um, uh, you know, call those your flats. And um, those would then be the next time you downloaded data, it would be a bunch of raw data, pictures of the inside of a piece of paper. Okay, and then you can, then you do that, uh, uh, or that calibration yourself. Um, I mean, you know, I, I've done a lot of calibrating different telescopes. This, this is really not any different than any other telescope. Like I say, there's there's nothing really new. It's simply been packaged um, in in a um, you know prêt à manger, ready to go. Okay. Is there any other questions from the group? And if you if you sent um, if you if somebody wanted to see a few images, I can just email you a couple of images um, with the headers and stuff like that. Okay. Well, I think um, uh, Unistellar should hire you to go around the country to all the astronomy clubs and and sell one of these to each club. I think I think you'd have a higher success rate. They have certainly people, with a presentation like this. They have people doing that already. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, the real selling point is public outreach, which yeah. they are doing. I mean, if Celestron had been doing public outreach this well, um, we would all be astronomers today. Okay. Uh, they, they, any, any final thoughts or... or um... Are you finished now? I'm done. Okay, there you go. 
All right, so we, we've reached our, our break time. Um, last night we tried a 10 minute break. That stretched on a little too long. Let's try a five minute break. Then we'll get back for the second half of our program. And um, yeah, we'll pick it up then. Or let me just throw this out. Does everyone want a break or do you just wanna keep going? Okay, if you wanna keep going, raise a hand. Okay, there's a few hands. No, okay, I think, well, most people are, have their video turned off. So I guess that wasn't a good way to go. Anyway, we'll take, we'll take a five minute break. And uh, so we're 7.48 p.m. here in the West Coast. We'll be back in five minutes, 7.53. Okay. Where'd you get that hand mill? The reactions button down at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Close. Yes, to, to the right, you have, you have clapping hands, thumbs up, crying, surprise, love, party, and more. Hey, yeah. Richard. This is Chris. Um, quick question, if you haven't left yet for your break, is there a uh, stacking camera that has Wi-Fi that you know of? I don't think he can hear me. Yeah, I think he's taking his break. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would like to do a stacking camera for my 20 inch and uh, use it for outreach, but I don't want all the wires. Well, you, can, uh, uh, we, you can ask him when he comes back in four minutes, three minutes. Okay. Chris, this is, yes. This, it, it, at least the original had a 224 camera in it, a little color. They're about $159 now. I just got this one last week. Um, to a little QHY. Um, and then if you get the, the Shao, or the, the, not the Shao, the ZWO, you can get their stacking software, their software stacks. Oh, that'd be perfect. And so you can, you, you can run their 224 camera with their software and it will stack and you can run it on, um, on theirs. I think you have to, I think you have to run it on a PC, but you can use one of these little, you know, the little minis and then Bluetooth or Wi-Fi to wherever you want to with it. Yeah, what I found works really well is I use my phone to receive Wi-Fi and then I smart view to a smart TV and uh, then I can view whatever I want and there's no wires. Right. Well, in this case, what, what you could do something similar or you could use the mini PC and just run it over to your monitor <laughs> to, yeah. to your TV. But yeah, that, that's actually what I'm setting up, except I'm setting it up on a finder. Oh, that looks great. And what's the name of that camera again? Uh, this is the QHY. Uh, QHY. 5L3224. Perfect. And at least last two weeks ago, they were on sale. So. I've written that down. Thank okay, you so but, much. But the ZWO ASI 224 is the one that I think you can get the stacking software for for free. But there is other stacking software out there that's also for free. So I think Registack is free. Okay. Oh, and uh, shoot, what's the name of it? Um, The software everybody uses for EAA, that also does, I believe, align and stack and is also free. There's a version of it that's free. Okay. Thank you. You have a good break. That helps a lot.
Okay, believe it or not, five minutes has gone by. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to know who has come back because everyone has their their video and their audio turned off. So if you do come back, could you at least turn one of those on so we know who is uh, is here? So we don't want to start the presentation before we have a quorum. Well, let me say, I don't want to start it before we have a quorum. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and if you do miss some of this, there's always the recordings, right? Okay, so I'm going to uh, okay. I'm going to go ahead and start. Okay, now, you know, for those who have been at any number of the alt as workshops when in, in, in the pre-COVID times when it was held in the actual workshop at Dan's um, shop at TMS. Um, for, for a number of years, our, our, our good but late friend, Peter Abrahams, gave a, a talk about some topic of astronomical history. And uh, it became part of the program and something I certainly look forward to. And, you know, based on the conversations that spurred afterwards during our breaks, it, it was a real popular feature. Well, after he passed away a few years ago, it just seemed fitting to include a, a, a talk of some aspect of, of astronomical history, telescope history, and continue that in, in his memory. And that's, and that's what this is all about. Plus, this is really interesting, and, and frankly, I, I learned a few things in the process of putting this presentation together. So, um, okay, so here, let's, let's just go ahead and do it. So on your screen, there's a, uh, there's a, this wonderful image, and, and anyone, the, the, the few people out there who have silvered their own mirrors, knows exactly what they're looking at here. This is a, a relatively large looking mirror on a, uh, on a silvering jig. I'm gonna talk about this in, in more detail further on in the presentation. Okay, but you know, it's always good to find out what came before silver. And I'm sure everyone knows it was speculum metal. You know, we just call it speculum. Speculum is a Latin word for mirror. So when you say it's a speculum mirror, you're really saying mirror, mirror. Um, but, you know, for, for 200 years, 1668 to 1868, from, from Newton's first reflector to the great Melbourne telescope, this is what telescope mirrors are made out of. Uh, There's a blend of um, two, parts, two parts copper and one part tin maybe with a bit of zinc or arsenic. And it was ungodly heavy. It was the most difficult material to grind, polish, and figure. And you needed to make two of these for any given telescope because it tarnished so fast. So you always needed to have one in the shop getting repolished and sometimes refigured as well because you, know, you repolish, <laughs> you're gonna change the figure. And at best, they were 60 to 60% 60 reflective, which is about the same as, as platinum, which um, it gives, I think for, for me, that gives me an idea of just how reflective it really was. Okay, so, but then everything changed for the better, silver on glass mirrors. Now, um, the, the process for silvering, depositing silver on glass was developed before 1857, but that was the year that these two gentlemen, Carl August von Steinhill and Leon Foucault, developed a process of de depositing an optical quality silver coating on a glass telescope mirror. So this was a watershed moment. Um, it's a huge advance. So now a telescope only needed one primary mirror. And because when it was time to resilver, it only took a day. And 
the resilvering process didn't affect the optical surface of the glass. So that was a gigantic advance. Now the, the photo on the left is a um, is is a wonderful image of the um, first large silver and glass mirror telescope. This was the uh, Foucault 80 centimeter that was at the Marseille Observatory in southern France in 1862. Um, now this is really a great image. It shows it in, in its dome. You know the this wonderful curved staircase up to the observing platform, which is just fantastic. When you step out onto this kind of spindly looking reinforced platform to get to the eyepiece. And evidently this whole eyepiece finder scope, and I think these are some counterweights, that is rotatable along the top of the telescope. Now, if you look down here, this is the, the mirror cell. And when the telescope would be pointed straight up and down, it'd be very easy to have a, uh, a pallet that that whole cell of mirror could be lowered down onto for, for resilvering. So, you know, a really cool design. You know, I have another picture of this coming up here in, in just a sec. But anyway, this was also, this 80 centimeter mirror was the first large mirror figured with Foucault's knife edge test. So at f5.8, you can imagine that the figure was probably pretty good at f5.8. And amazingly, this telescope was in service for 103 years. Here's a color photo of it today. I mean, you can see it's made almost entirely out of wood, which just, I think for me, goes to show that if you take care of a wooden scope and in the right environment, that it can last a long time. And now here you can see or the eyepiece is, has been rotated around from the, the older photograph. Um, this must uh, have been a, an absolute rev revelation for the astronomers. They have, you know, 96% reflecting 80 centimeter telescope. Um, and in fact, um, this was a telescope that Edward Stefan discovered his famous quintet of galaxies, Stefan's quintet in 1876 among many, many other discoveries. Okay, so some of you might recognize these two steel frames. This is from a, uh, a movie online called Telescope Makers. This is a, is a short British film. Uh, and it just kind of shows how the silvering was done. Um, you know, the, the dam was built around the edge of the mirror. The, the silver and chemicals were, were poured onto the optical surface. It was sloshed around and um, then it was, it was drained out and then rinsed, uh, as you can see in the, in the bottom frame. Um, and you get, end up with this brilliant, beautiful surface in, in, in practically no time at all. It, it took practice, you know, <laughs> as, as we know, to, to get a good coating. Um, the chemicals are touchy. You had to mix them at the time. They, they weren't good to sit on the shelf. And some of the early chemical formulations, you had to, to formulate just before you use them because if you put them on the shelf for a few hours, they might explode. So it, was, it could be rather dangerous. Um, and again, you, know, you had to start with perfectly clean glass like we do today. And you also might notice that the, the gentleman in, in these two frames isn't wearing eye protection or a respirator. I don't get it. Uh, oh, well, the old days. All right, so this is, this might seem like a step back in time, but actually it isn't. Um, this is a picture of the great um, Melbourne telescope, GMT, that was built in 1868. So this is six years after the Foucault 80 centimeter silver on glass mirror. Okay, and it was in, so this was installed in Australia in 1869. So this telescope, 48 inch mirror, could have had a, a silver on glass mirror. But um, interestingly, um, the group that uh, was designing this telescope, you know, Irish and, and British, invited Foucault to give a talk on his silver and glass 
mirrors and they made him a fellow of their society and completely ignored everything he said and went ahead and made two 48 inch speculum mirrors for this telescope. Um, it operated at F41, F40, imagine that, F41 at an F7.6 primary. Um, it did innovate a, a equatorial counterbalance mount with a um, gravity driven drive, which was the first for a large re re reflector. Um, but this is also the last large telescope design primarily for visual use. So it was, it was kind of a dinosaur as it was being built, because this is also the era when Huggins was starting to figure out what things in the universe were made out of with the spectroscope. Okay, so now this is the beginnings of the modern era of telescope mirrors coming up now. Now uh, here's that great image that was at the beginning of the presentation. This is the Mount Wilson 60 inch mirror after it was first silvered in 1908. Um, now just look at that silver inject. You know, again, to, I'm talking mostly to, to the people who have actually silvered mirrors. Um, I mean, that, that just looks like a really robust, well-engineered, well-designed silvering jig. I love the handle coming out uh, on the upper right, obviously used to adjust the tilt. Um, uh, it's just fabulous. And it, it looks like a perfect coating. Of course, you can't really tell in a, in a photo like this, but um, I just think it's just absolutely marvelous photo. And you can see this whole rig is on rails, which probably went right up to the bottom of the 60 inch telescope, because this is the cell that the, the mirror sat in in the telescope and then he just rebolted it on to the, the bottom end of the tube. Now this is a picture, a great picture of the 100 inch hooker mirror. Um, and this was taken, this was, this, this, this was taken much later because this is a 1935. Um, and you can see the, the guys there, they're, they're stripping, the silver coating off the mirror. They're preparing the 100 inch mirror for its first aluminum coating. So this is, this is right at the end of the silver on glass mirror era for major observatory telescopes. But I mean, just look at that chunk of glass. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that is a lot of temperature inertia right there. Okay, and here are those two telescopes, the 60 inch on the left and the 100 inch on, on the right. Um, they were both designed originally to have silver on glass mirrors. The 60 inch had, had a silver coating for 27 years and the 100 inch for 18 years. Uh, it was 1935 that uh, Dr. John Strong developed the aluminizing process and had built aluminizing chambers big enough for these mirrors. And according to the sources I found, he got a perfect coating on his first try for both mirrors. So that was a pretty good start. So, okay, so now, okay, aluminizing took over um, for good reason. Aluminum coatings, much more durable. They don't tarnish. Uh, they don't degrade from atmospheric particles landing on them. Um, they just last longer. And for you know, a major observatory, that's a big deal. They don't want to have to take their, their mirror out of the telescope any more often than they really have to. Okay, that, that brings up spray silvering. Now, as it turns out, the spray silver process was invented in 1930, which was five years before Strong developed the uh, aluminizing process with vacuum deposition. So uh, Dr. William Peacock, a chemist, formed a, a company, Peacock Laboratories, you know, in 1930, and came up with this process where the silvering chemicals were mixed in, in, in a spray from two nozzles, which is very similar to the, the process that we're used to now that is offered by Angel Gilding. Now, the, um, uh, that was the first go around, and then 
in the 70s, Tinsley Labs and the University of Arizona refined the process. And the, the, uh, the page there on, on the left side of the screen is from a 1977 Applied Optics article by Bruce Armstrong. And this shows the spray silving process used at the Optical Science Center at the U of A. And, and you know, I, I sharpened up the, uh, the page because the, the images were kind of blurry. And this is as sharp as I could get them. But what's, what's very interesting to me is that this looks like exactly what we're doing today with the angel gilding process. Yeah, you know, if you start up here, they're, they're, they're cleaning the mirror and it's talking about the mirror is thoroughly clean with particular attention to the edge of the polished surface and the bevel. Okay, so we, we, we know how important that is. Then they apply the sensitizer, then they rinse, and then they, they have the spray silver chemicals are, 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 are applied. And you can kind of tell a difference in the image between the, the, the two where this is starting to become reflective. And now here's a completely coated surface that is being uh, blown dry with an air hose to get all the water off of it. So yeah, that's exactly what we're doing now with the angel gilding stuff. Um, I, I love this shot. This is uh, Peter Perkerer and he has silvered a number of, of, of mirrors. This is a 20 inch mirror. This is, uh, this is going into a museum actually. And, and Peter likes to use these hand spray bottles, you know, with the silver and chemicals in them. Um, and that, that works great. Um, it also is brutal on your hands because you're spray, 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 spray on, and it's, yeah, it's tough. You know, using the, um, the pump sprayer with dual nozzles that you know, Angel Gilding offers is much easier and it works just, they work just as well. So if you want a good hand workout, the, the hand bottles is, is certainly one, one way to do that. And here's the, uh, the, the pump spray, um, the angel gilding cells. And you can see the, the two nozzles side by side that are attached that uh, may make the process less physically demanding. Okay, now this, this is one of my, my favorite photos here. Um, this is a close-up shot of a 23-month-old spray silver coating. That's my 28-inch 28 28-inch mirror. Um, and you can see the reflectivities in 95% red, 88% green, 78% blue after 23 months of use. Um, and yeah, you know, there's no obvious in, the, in this picture, there's no obvious um, tarnishing. And, and visually at the time, there was just very, very little right along the edge on one side of the mirror. Um, but you can see all these spots. I mean, these little white spots, that's dust. But look at all these little brown circular and oval spots. And here's one that's got this big halo around it. And the whole mirror is covered with these things. And this is what is meant by the atmospheric contamination degrading the silver mirror. Whatever is in the air comes in, sticks to the silver coating and a, dis a chemical reaction starts and you get these brown spots, sometimes with really big halos. And if you rinse, try to wash off all the dust, all these spots are was where the silver coating would come off. So at that, that, that's the point where you go, okay, rather than wash the mirror, you're gonna take it out of the telescope anyway, it's time to put on a new silver coating. So um, to wrap this up, um, silvering telescope mirrors has only been around 164 years, um, not very long, of course, you know, luminizers have been around even less. But it seems that in, in this short amount of time and with the way material sciences have progressed and continue to progress, that there should be an inexpensive, easy to apply, long lasting, completely transparent optical quality overcoat that will completely stop tarnishing 
and then definitely protect the silver coating from atmospheric contaminants. Is that so much to ask? <laughs> Um, yeah, it probably is. I don't, I don't really know. But if, if, if that could be developed, it would certainly be a, um, uh, a boon to those of us who, who put a spray silver coating on our telescope mirrors. Um, there, there, there seems to be uh, an ineffable product of, of a silver coated image in, the, uh, in an eyepiece. The, the, the star colors are more distinct. The contrast in general is, is, is greater. It's just a, a beautiful image. Now that could be, of course, just a, a product of the mind convincing itself that all the trouble I just went through was really worth it. But other people have, have come up and and said much the same thing. So I'm thinking it, it might be real. So, um, so that's it for my this short talk. Um, thank you I for got your a quick attention. One, Howard. Yeah. Well, if such a coding is ever developed, you know the group that's going to test it. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here we are. Yeah. Um, here that's we are. right. So, uh, yeah. I, uh, I'm really tell? inspired by the, uh, the the silvering jig of the 60 inch mirror, though I have to say, that is, uh, and that's just the, one of the coolest old astronomical photographs I, I've come across. Okay, so I think yeah, I just want to throw in one more, um, okay. real quick. Uh, I just got news this week that a an eight inch telescope mirror that I silvered three years ago and is in the Rose City Astronomers Lending Library uh, is still functional. Hmm. And they're using it. Now it's probably got it's probably got some tarnish on it. I haven't seen it. I've requested that I get my hands on it soon. But um, yeah, if you, I guess if you don't know any better, it can last even longer than what we would tolerate. <laughs> That's well, interesting yeah. to me. Yeah. That, 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 that picture of the 23 month coating, um, that's the coating I used in my 28 inch when I did my observations for the, um, the Veil Nebula for my Sky and Telescope article. Um, oh. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it was totally functional. Um, you know, I, 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 could, I could still be using it. And in my next presentation, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, actually. So on that point, you know, why don't I just go ahead into that next one? Okay, does everyone see the full screen there? Hello, hello. Yeah, good, yes, Howard. Yep. Okay, all right, good. All right, here we go. All right, so um, as I mentioned last night, the um, you could pretty much point at random at any part of Ed's Elvira 24 inch F 2.7 telescope and, and find that it, it has a, a, a wonderfully thought out, beautifully made, completely optimized, whatever it is. Um, and his complete ventilation system is something he gave a presentation on at the Oregon Star Party a few years ago that really got my attention. I first seen it, come across it on a cloudy night forum uh, series of, of posts. And it was, it's interesting, but I didn't really look at it that closely until I really didn't think about it until uh, I saw his presentation at the OSP. Oop. Okay. Okay, and my 
Uh, presentation doesn't want to advance. So let me try bringing it up again. All right. Okay. All right, now, now I am having technical difficulties too. My cursor has disappeared. Oh, for Pete's sakes. All right. I don't know what's going on here. All right, I'm gonna stop that and try it again. Let's just... Uh, That, that, here, share screen, share screen. All right. Okay. We've got, we've got the image up, Howard. Okay, let's see if, okay, good. Now the, the slides are changing. Okay, so, yeah. all right, so back on track here. So, all right, so what is a complete ventilation system or, or CVS? Um, that's a very good question. Um, and this diagram, you know, it takes some explaining and looking into, but essentially what it is, it's a system where HEPA-filtered air is blown in through the back of the telescope, and it comes up, and the mirror is enveloped in this flow of air, which has created a, I'm guessing it's pronounced a Kawanda effect, um, and that, that cools the mirror and also protects it from outside contamination. As long as that airflow is going, because the, the air is actually hugging the surface of the front, front surface of the mirror. Um, and when, when I really got my head around that, a light bulb went off and says, well, that's exactly what I need, you know, in theory, to um, protect the spray silver coating on my mirror. So I said, okay, this is gonna be worth building um, and, and and adapting to fit on my existing 28 inch telescope. So basically the Coanda effect, as you can see on the left, is the tendency of a fluid or air jet to adhere to a nearby surface and remaining adhered. And that's exactly what's going on here. So just to, to run through the diagram real quickly, this is the help of filter. You have radial fans on the inside of the, of the, of the HEPA filter. So it's just pulling in, you turn on the fans and that pulls in air from the outside that comes through the HEPA filter. So all contaminants are removed from that. Heck, um, HEPA filters remove the uh, COVID-19 virus. So that, that shows you just how, how, how well they work. And then the rest of this, which I'll, I'll get into in a little bit, basically this shows the airflow, the blue arrows that go around the back and front of the mirror. Okay, so this is basically it, okay? The system works, you have a sealed mirror box, the help of filter, so I just explained. Um, there is a curved air baffle. Okay, that's this little thing, and that goes all the way around the outer perimeter of the front of the mirror. The airflow meets in the middle of the mirror and is directed outwards towards the, the uh, diagonal mirror. That's what's going on here. And as a result, the mirror is evenly cooled and protected from atmospheric contaminants. What's not to like? Okay, so as I already, already answered this question, you know, I want to. This is this is the 
the spray silver coating that's on the 28 inch now. I did this in, uh, in late April of this year and um, it turned out beautifully. And not only that, I'm proud to say I, I did it on my very first attempt. <laughs> um, my, my first attempts at silvering, I think it was like five or six before I got a serviceable coating, but with terrible edge problems. Uh, the next time it took me three attempts, um, but that was mostly because of technical difficulties with my sprayer. Um, and then this time, boom, first, first attempt. I could not have been happier. It's just an absolutely beautiful coating. <clears throat> so now I have a, um, this is sitting inside the, the mirror box of my 28 inch telescope that has been upgraded with the CVS. Okay, so this is that, that photo again. That's, this is from the previous coating. This is what I'm trying to, I don't think it's gonna prevent um, this from happening, but it should certainly reduce the amount of dust that settles on the mirror and anything else that wants to, to settle on it. And if it can just, okay, if it, if it took 23 months for the last coating to get to this state, if it can take, double that time to get to this state with the CVS, I'll be a happy boy. Okay, so this is the back of Edscope. Um, this is the HEPA filter. This is the, uh, the black material is a pre-filter material. And this is just a, a cover on the back. And over here on the right, you can see it has three radial fans tucked in here. And as I understand it, these, these metal cylinders are counterweights. And all of this is to basically counteract the vibration from the fans. And if, uh, if I'm mischaracterizing that, Ed, please, please pipe in and, uh, and correct me on that. Well, but you're, the, you're, you're on target. Okay, very good. <laughs> so so this, is, this is a real crucial element right here. The radial fans tucked inside the HEPA filter. Now that's how I did it. This is how I did it. So it's very similar. Okay, so this is the 28 inch. The, I took the mirror out and put it in a, a shipping container, which I, I still have. And this is, um, it turned flipped upside down. This is the back of the mirror cell. You can see the, uh, uh, the bottom of the uh, of the scope over here, and then I cut out this piece of it's called Vista Bond. It's uh, four millimeters thick. If you're familiar with um, uh, with any type of composite material, this is just uh, two very thin sheets of aluminum, one on each side, with a, uh, a plastic core. Uh, if you're familiar with the Luca Bond. This is what this is, it's only thinner. It's four millimeters instead of six millimeters. And this is the HEPA filter I bought. And you can see I placed, this is just placement here. They're not um, installed. These are the, the three radial fans I got. I just put them in there, making sure everything fit. Okay, now this is the, um, after some work I put a, a, uh, a base inside of the HEPA filter. And that's what my radial fans are attached to. These are the, the ports where the radial fans blow out. And these are the wires that, that power them. Um, this is that Vista Bond that has been painted black. Well, for, first of all, this white printed, that's just a, a coating that peels off. And when you peel it off, you have a, a white um, piece on both sides. So this is it painted black on the inside. I drilled three holes here, and those three holes do not line up with these three holes. This is basically to create a, a plenum where the air builds up pressure and the pressurized air comes out through those three holes. And you can see this in, in more of a perspective over here. And you just notice these wires just kind of come over here and disappear and go to the outside, to the backside, where we'll get to here just in a minute. 
Okay, now this round disc, that is a, a diff I think of it as a diffuser. That's just so the, the air coming out those three holes um, in the back of the uh, Vista Bond don't just blast into the, the center of the mirror on the backside. So that diffuses that outward. So you get a more even um, cooling effect. That's all that's for. Okay, now this again is the, uh, the, the backside of, of the telescope tipped upside down. And this shows the, uh, the installed HEPA filter with this cover on it. Um, these are two battery packs. This one is for the fans, and that's a little switch that Ed recommended I get. It's off and on, but it also is a variable power. So you can have a infinitely controllable from low to high speed settings for the three fans. This battery is for my uh, diagonal mirror dew heater. And what's cool about these two batteries is that on the side you can't see, there's an on and off switch. And this is what the, uh, the covers on them, um, which uh, is really a remarkable thing. I found these boxes and these batteries that fit together so well. And this has worked out really well. Okay, now this is for the front part of the system. This is the, the front baffle of the telescope. It's turned upside down. This is a, um, a flexible cove trim I found on Amazon. And it's flexible. Um, it, it's for, it's for uh, putting trim around curved architectural pieces. And it's attached with, um, with super glue. They're very easy. But it kind of, you get this real chunky shape to it. So that's shown here on this piece here on the right. I sanded this down with a piece of sandpaper wrapped around a, a piece of round wood doweling. And it took maybe an hour to sand the whole thing down. Um, and then I painted the whole inside black and uh, it was ready to go. So this is with the, the, the front, the whole front baffle. This is the outside of it. This is the, the now painted black part, oops. This is the painted black part of that uh, um, sanded flexible cove trim. This is its reflection on the mirror. But you can see that the black space is about a five millimeter gap between the top end or the bottom edge of that, of that flexible cove trimming or, the, or that um, um, circular air baffle. And that focuses all the pressurized air that's inside the mirror box now and creates that coenda effect that now bays the entire surface of the primary mirror with air meeting in the center and then shooting outwards towards the diagonal mirror. It's pretty cool. The, uh, I did the same type of test that, that Ed did on his Cloudy Nights thread where he has a video where he has a, a yardstick with little pieces of, of tissue paper taped to it as telltales. And you can see the, the air um, blowing them around um, as he moves that ruler around the, uh, the edge of the, of the mirror. So it's pretty impressive. Okay, now for the mirror cover, um, this is pretty straightforward. The, it's got another piece of that Vista bond, but I cut, cut a hole in the center here. So when I have the mirror cover on, I can turn on the radio fans to pre-cool the mirror before I take the mirror cover off. And this hatch, this hatch just flips up and down to, um, to open or close that. And I, it has a, a, a much more refined and beautifully, um, made system on, uh, on his Elvira. This, this is very basic, but it's, it has the same idea. Um, I, I sent this whole presentation to Ed uh, last week, 
to, to see if I had made any gross misstatements. And, and he came back and he said, no, it looks okay. It looks okay. And he says, Hey, have you ever, that's, that's a great idea. Just having a hatch there. You can collimate without taking the mirror cover off. <laughs> I went, oh yeah, I guess I could never occurred to me. So, um, that's something I'll do in the future, but this is a great case of uh, inadvertent optimization. Okay, so how is it working? Um, so I mentioned earlier, I, the silver coating I have on now was sprayed in April. So this is uh, in late about, yeah, this is almost exactly six months now. And so far the mirror is, looks very clean and there are only a few spots. Um, this is, it, it's, it's, it's looking much better at this point than my previous coatings looked at this point. So I'm encouraged, you know, we'll see how well it uh, continues to hold up, you know, through the winter, you know, it's going to be even uh, moisture observing conditions for sure. But uh, so far, so good. Um, this is, this is a big project, um, you know, get, getting to this point took probably two months of off and on work, mostly because I would get to one point and then I had to order something else from online and then I had to wait for that to get here. And then uh, most of the time is what I needed, but sometimes I needed something different. But if I'd had everything I needed right at the beginning, this probably would have taken me two or three weekends. And I'm, I'm also fortunate that, um, you know, my telescope is, is built to readily accept this type of system. So this, this is a, some very recent pictures just taken last month showing the, the implementation of Ed CVS on the 28 inch. And you can see here, this is the, uh, the uh, HEPA filter. This is the, the pre-filter material on the outside. These are the two battery boxes. This is the one that has the battery for the fans. This is a close-up of the HEPA filter. And you can see I've peeled back the pre-filter to show another, oops, another layer of, of pre-filter. This is actually anti-tarnish cloth. Um, and I thought, what the heck? You know, why don't I try putting a layer of anti-tarnish cloth on here as well? I don't know if any of the magic from, from, from that is going to filter in through the air or not. But, you know, what the heck is worth a try, right? On the front of the, uh, the mirror cover, which you didn't see in the earlier picture, this is that front port that's covering up that hole in the, in the middle of the mirror cover. I've added these two same boxes that I used for the batteries on the back side. I have two rechargeable desiccant containers. Um, there are, I drilled two holes behind each, each of these two. So they have direct access to whatever air is inside with the mirror. And this is simply to keep moisture from condensing on the silver coating after I put the mirror cover on. And so far that has worked great. And another part, important part of, of the system is making sure the shroud is attached snugly to the mirror box. So you, you don't wanna have any large gaps or, or the whole effect can be, um, of the Coanda effect can, can be reduced. How much, I don't know, but anyway. So what I ended up needing to do was to add the side, these baffles here in the side, because these weren't here originally. Um, and when I pull the shroud down, there would be a gap of about an inch where air could get in. So I added these, so you can see now with the, the shroud, there's no gaps. And a very, a very simple thing I did to help keep the shroud, excuse me, in place was that I just have these, in each corner I have these two hex bolts sticking out that basically hook the, the bottom of the, uh, the shroud so it stays there, so it doesn't want to pull off. 
And that also has worked well so far. Okay, so here's the, the scope as it is now. This is at Chickahominy Reservoir in uh, South Central Oregon. Um, this was taken last March when I was doing my observations for the, uh, the Cygnus Sloop article. And um, yeah, I, so far so good. Like I said, I, I'm very happy and uh, uh, it was well worth the effort. And if, if your telescope is, is, um, is made in such a way that you can adapt it to Ed's CVS system or you're building a scope that you could add something like this on, uh, I recommend it as worth the effort. So that's uh, that's it for me. If you have any questions or comments, we'll take that. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll call Thank it. Thank you, Howard. Yeah. Thank you. Good to get some uh, real world uh, feedback. Ah, yeah, yeah. It was it was a uh, it was a project I went into with some trepidation, but I knew I wanted it, and so. You know, every time I, I, I build a telescope, I go into, into it with some trepidation because, you know, there's always some, some unknowns there. But um, this worked out really well. Your, your um, example was inspiring for me, and I, I think it uh, hopefully will be inspiring to others as well. Hey, Howard. Um, yeah. I saw in the, on the, in the reflection in the mirror, uh, a really nice stool. A nice what? Stool. Stool. It, it was like a wiki thing. I really like that. <laughs> okay. I, I don't think I noticed that. Well, go back. Go back in your presentation and look. When you're looking in the mirror, of your, your primary mirror, freshly silvered, you can see the uh, a really nice stool. Howard, while you're doing that, I have a question about that air gap around the perimeter of the mirror. Oh, yeah, um, I see it. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. And I was curious if that gap, if you ever notice any non-uniformity in the gap around the circumference as a function of collimation, perhaps. Ah, that's a very good question. Yes, yes, yes. Let's, let's go to that image here. Um, oh. Now we're, okay. That's the one, the better yeah. image of the stool too. Yeah, yeah, there's <laughs> the same stool. <laughs> um, so uh. now what, what I found was that, okay, when I, when I first put this all together, of course, you know, I had taken everything apart. I also took this uh, opportunity to take the entire telescope apart to clean it and repaint it because it was all dinged up and whatnot. So, so I put everything back together, I put the mirror in, I put the front cover on, everything ready to go. And then I adjust the collimation screws to get a consistent gap all the way around. And I put the, then I put my collimation tools in and I go, holy smoly, this thing is way out of whack. So then I collimate it and I go back and I look at the gap and it is now way different all the way around. So what that told me was that my um, diagonal cage was not directly over the primary mirror. Um, you know, it, was pro it was probably, you know, maybe a quarter inch out or something like that. But it, it does show how, um, it is a, a, a sensitive indicator of, of, of how well that's lined up. Of course, normal collimation takes care of that. So what I ended up doing is I, I collimated it, and then I just added some um, different thicknesses of weather stripping on the back side, which you can see in this image is weather stripping to make up that difference so that it, now it is easy. Ah, so you just adjusted the cover. Perfect. Yes, I just adjusted the oh. cover. 
yeah, I thought about you know, adjusting the length of the, the truss tubes. And then went, eh, no, I'll just do it this way. <laughs> Yeah. This is more of a shortcut, and it, um, I, I don't see that it's uh, made any negative effect one way or the other. Um, maybe more a question for Ed, but um, what is the sensitivity of that air gap? Is it, do you have to have it you know, within a millimeter out of five or within a micron out of five? Well, <laughs> okay, well, we're dealing with airflow and the calculators that I put into the uh, video on YouTube um, give you approximately a 50% roughly um, variance. Uh, I call it engineer's prerogative. In other words, I know when people do something, they may not quite meet the specification. So you want to design things to be able to work even if they don't quite make it. Uh, it's, a, it's an old time-honored tradition. Uh, but uh, the, there's other obstructions, too, that uh, you would think that would be a problem. For instance, mirror clips, would, uh, you would think that would create a problem, but it doesn't. Airflow just run it very nicely. Mm -hmm. And the smoke test proved that uh, 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 very nicely. It's good videos using smoke tests. Um, and Basically, uh, you can have a pretty major error in the in the uh, director ring or the uh, uh, annular nozzle, and it'll still meet in the center, and it'll still produce the uh, uh, the uh, perpendicular column towards the secondary. Uh, so it's not super critical as far as accuracy uh, side to side. The overall effect just needs to have the more or less the right height. Um, because we're, we're dealing with uh, uh, another gap also, which is the, uh, the ring is slightly larger than the uh, diameter of the mirror, so we don't vignette it. Uh, so there's actually two gaps, uh, in, in essence, that we have to make sure that we work with. And this, the design takes both those into account. And um, I, I experimented a little bit with uh, adjusting that gap. Um, I, I think I had a, uh, a two and a half millimeter gap to start with. And I was, I was doing a lot of uh, tests at the eyepiece to see how the figure was being affected. And it just, it just seemed to create a, a very large area in the center that was very, very turbulent. So then I went to, um, I think the eight millimeters, and that really reduced the effect. But, um, you know, when I did the, um, the telltale test with the little strips of tissue on a, uh, on a ruler, the airflow across the mirror was really reduced. So then I w went to five, I did the, the calculator thing as, uh, that Ed has, and that suggested five was right in the sweet zone, and that's what's worked the best. Uh, Howard, uh, do you want to uh, maybe tell folks a little bit about the difference between acclimation speed versus a preserving speed and then any um, uh, visual, uh, you know, anomalies or anything like that uh, from, from running the system? Sure, sure. So from my experience, if you know, I set the telescope up and I turn the fans on all the way, I go in the house for an hour and a half. I'll come back outside and the, the figure of the mirror is, uh, is way out of whack. Um, so I'll turn the mirror down to, to its, its lowest speed where it's actually doing something. And within five minutes, I have my normal, wonderfully corrected mirror back. Now, one thing I, I, I did at first, which I removed, um, let's go back here do, 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 to, yes, you can see on Annette's diagram here, he has this insulation along the outside, on the sides of the mirror that wraps all the way around. And as I remember, you did that at the recommendation of Mike Lockwood. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, I tried that at first and 
then I was curious, I mean, how much of a difference does it make? So I took it off and I didn't see that it made any difference. Now that could be because I have an F4 mirror and this is an F2.75, maybe, I don't know. Um, so it, it, it's something to, um, that is, I think a, a point that is up in the air in terms of, of how useful it is on any given mirror. But I, I would guess that if I, if I had to say that on a faster mirror is probably a fairly important feature to have. Hey, this is Chris speaking. Hey, Chris. Are you there? Yep. Hey, do you have my image? I just wanted to show you I what I'm doing it. with my 34. So yeah. I've got the radio fans mounted here. And that's where my hole is going to be behind the mirror. And I'll put a plenum there. Yeah. I just, uh, you guys are such experts and inspired me on this. I'm thinking this is going to work. That's where I'm at on my <laughs> project. And I just wanted okay. to say thank you so much for you guys. Yeah, that, that, yeah, I, I, I'd say that's, that's a very good chance of working. So the, the fans are the, so those are radial fans and they're blowing into the square pocket here, which goes right, straight right, up. right. Okay. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah. And they go. Yeah. Straight up to here. We have this pocket and I can put a baffle like right here or a diffuser because the mirror will sit right about here on top of the second there or on the mirror um, bracket. Yeah. But so it'll come out here and then I'll do the exactly what you've guys got going on there. So. And then on this side, of course, instead of using a uh, HEPA filter that's round, I'll do a square one with slots so it just slides in and slides out. Ah, and very good. Just thought that would keep the profile lower for yeah. what my design is. So I had to be very careful in the HEPA filter I selected to be able to fit you know, my existing Telescope. Hear this? Yeah. Well, you this, guys have done great work. Here. So I just wanted to uh, get a quick comment and make sure I was on the right direction. It looks looks good to me. You guys. Yeah, it's not it a looks good. Yeah. Yeah, looks good. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Howard, one of the questions I get asked. Uh, quite often is does uh, when it's operating at uh, whatever observing speed is, it's, it's going to be different for everybody in every scope. Uh, the, you know, the acclimation speed can be calculated. That's pretty easy, but uh, observing speed is a, is a, uh, you know, a mix of uh, other uh, things that are a little harder to predict. So the question is, uh, does it affect the image at all at observing speed, the uh, tightness of stars, et cetera, and uh, is there any visible artifacts, uh, you know, turbulent air flows or anything like that that could be seen at the eyepiece? Uh, there is one speed um, somewhere in between. It's a little higher than my observing speed that either creates some buffeting in the airflow or a vibration that the first time I tried it made the stars these little rotating ellipses. <laughs> it was kind of cool, <laughs> alarming too. Um, so turning it up higher than that or lower than that um, uh, re removes that effect. The, you know, what I, let me, let me just say that when I have it at observing speed after the mirror is cooled, um, the mirror has its normal figure um, and, and the air is blowing for, for me, primarily just to keep contaminants from sticking to the silver coating. When I turn it on full blast at the beginning of, the, of an evening now to cool it, I'll keep it on full blast for maybe 10 minutes now. Because that's really all I need. Because the, the, the mirror is just bathed in, in, in 
beautifully pure ambient air temperature air and it's just uh, there, there's no other way to get that type of cooling that quickly so it, it works really well what it doesn't do is make the mirror work any better than it possibly could anyway you know it doesn't make a bad mirror into a good mirror right <laughs> and it doesn't degrade a good mirror into a poor one that's good to hear yes Oh, we have some some things on chat here. Let's check it out. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, I think these are. Okay, here's one. Based on my anti-tarnish cloth idea, I wonder if you could pipe the air through some sulfur absorbing chemicals and extend the lifetime, extend the lifetime of the coating. Um, yeah, that's, and as Akarsh noted just after that, yeah, that's what the cloth does. Um, and actually Rob said that. Um, so wh whether that's going to make any material impact over time or not, we'll, we'll see, this is an experiment. Um, I'm, you know, unfortunately, uh, there's no way to do a control, um, and, and maybe the CVS without the, um, uh, the anti-tarnish cloth would work just as well. I just threw it in there because I just want the damn thing that the last as long as it possibly can. <laughs> so, because um, that 28-inch uh, mirror it weighs 92 pounds, and that gets heavier every time I, I, I try to get it out of there. Yeah, uh, uh, Howard, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I looked up that that's what the anti-tarnish cloth does. Uh, what I was thinking of was, uh, you know, in, uh, in chemistry lab or whatever, uh, they, if you want to dry out an air, uh, uh, air stream uh, from water or something, you'd actually put it in a, uh, pass that air to a, um, a, some sort of a container containing a solid desiccant. Um, so, so I meant more like a bulk material rather than a cloth. Where ah. I think I think you won't uh, you won't have much higher surface area of uh, f so that this thing can absorb um, the the gases rather than if it went through a uh, a thin uh, cloth which has less surface area. Right? right. That that was my thinking. Okay. But no, that, I don't know uh, if you want to build a chemical plant behind your telescope in no. uh, addition to like an air system <laughs> no no can, I, can mean, I, the, the, I was gonna say howard if i could uh, say um there's a number of pieces of artwork around the world that have a similar type design where a uh um uh there is a director uh, around the artwork to uh, to uh, uh put a uh, layer of air usually a laminar flow connected by a coanda uh, across a, a piece of artwork, usually it's a precious metals and things like that that are very ornate uh, in a setting where they don't want to use glass over the front of it or s some other protective measure. They want to keep it, um, the artwork, uh, very visible, I guess, to the public. But they also, behind that, will use various processing. Either they'll dry the air or they'll chemically uh, clean the air, particularly in the uh, heavily polluted cities, to remove some of the uh, the uh, the contaminants that can really attack the uh, the precious metals like gold and silver. Right. So there are uh, examples of that around. There's one uh, I forget the name of the church. It's a French church uh, has some large ornate doors, yeah, and they have an article a, about that. Yeah, they have a they have the air curtain um, uh, uh, surrounding these doors. And projecting across them to protect them from the uh, from the um, uh, urban uh, yeah, pollution. Uh, so yes, it's done uh, in other and used for other things besides uh, telescopes, obviously. But uh, there's artwork, and then there's a whole lot of it used in uh, 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 manufacturing processes, particularly in films and whatnot. Uh, so it's, it's nothing new. It's just a little different application of uh, something that's it's been done in the past. But it is perfectly possible to to pre-treat the air and uh, scrub it of the offending chemicals and uh, uh, or compounds and also uh, pre-dry it if you want to go to that much trouble. 
Right. And on that note, um, when I first installed the system, I did put those rechargeable desiccant boxes inside the uh, HEPA filter with the, uh, with the radial fans. <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that worked really well for one night because the, it, it's so saturated the, the dehumidifiers <laughs> uh, run, running even at observing speed that it just shows us how much moisture there, there, there was in the air. Now, if I live someplace like in the high desert or central Oregon, that would be less of a concern. But um, yeah, if I could have really dry and clean air, that would be even better for the soil. So, oh well. So Howard, I have a question. Looking at that photo, you've got your three fans down inside the HEPA filter, uh, kind of aimed in a little bit of a spiral. Um, are they, I assume they're blowing inward. Yes. It's, it's kind of hard to define inward. They're, they're kind of blowing in a circular fashion. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't a, a, a different arrangement pull more air through that filter? Um. That's, that's probably a better question for Ed, but I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Um, okay, this is the bottom of my HEPA filter. The fans are installed to this base I put inside the HEPA filter. Um, so the, the, the fans are blowing, in this image, they're going to be blowing down, downward. The, he, he's thinking oh. of the wrong kind of fan. Okay, yeah, they, you know they, what? I'm looking at those and thinking they're muffin fans, but they're squirrels. These are not them. muffin fans, no. Okay, totally. Radio fans. Them. So if you looked at these from the side, you would see the fan, but the air is blowing straight down through these, these holes. Yeah, okay. That makes perfect sense now. Yeah. Okay. All righty then. Okay, we've got everyone's questions and comments. Okay, Dan liked it. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Good job, Howard. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and, you know, all, all kudos to you, Ed, for, for not only coming up with this idea, which I don't, I had never encountered anything like this for a telescope. Um, that's for sure. And, and, and you're, you know, typically masterful implementation on Elvira it was really inspiring. Plus those, those really informative uh, threads on, on cloudy nights where you basically have all the information you need. Uh, Howard, uh, I forgot there are questions on YouTube. <laughs> I wanted to throw that in before uh, we cut off for the night. Sorry. Yeah, sorry yeah, go ahead. Um, so one is, is there a calculated ideal CFM value for the ventilation system? Uh, yeah, and the other is a comment for me uh, that what I'm describing was called a desiccant dehumidifier. Anyway, uh, yeah. yeah, so is there an ideal CFM value for the ventilation system? Uh, I'll let Dan answer that one. Okay, well, the CFM value varies depending on the size of the mirror. Uh, and that's based on a couple of things, one of it being the uh, velocity required to do the coupling, we try to achieve something in the plus or minus one meter per second range. Uh, that's at maximum speed. That's uh, uh, the acclimation speed. Anything more than that, you get into the uh, diminishing returns of uh, extracting heat from glass. So there's really no need to go any faster than that. Um, and uh, the system is sized to, to uh, go down from that number to the observing speed, which I mentioned earlier is kind of hard to calculate because it takes in uh, uh, so many other variables that uh, it just, just can't do it. Uh, so everybody has to use their own judgment as to what they feel um, observing speed. But for most, it's probably between uh, 15 and 25, uh, maximum 30 percent of of uh, maximum speed. And that's what's necessary to maintain the, uh, the air curtain and the laminar flow. And uh, that's, um, that's, that's the basis of the CFM rate. Okay. 
Okay, was there any, any other question there, Akersh? Uh, that's it for now. Okay, all right, very good. So let me stop this share. There we go, okay. So that's the, uh, the program for tonight. Um, tomorrow is uh, what I've been thinking of as big scope night. Um, we start off with the 800 millimeter or the 80 centimeter project. Uh, um, uh, I'm gonna butcher his name. I asked him how to pronounce his name properly. It's Italian, sorry. It's uh, Michele Scotti. He, he says he, well, he's working in the UK, so everyone calls him Mike. So we can call him Mike, he said. And then Tong is going to talk to us about his 40 inch of 3.3 folded Newtonian. Um, Mel is going to talk about um, his 30 inch and prospects for his 42 inch thin meniscus mirrors and a backseat 20 inch mirror. Um, and then we're going to end up with Dan giving us an update on the 36 inch F4 direct drive telescope that he, he ran through the design with us last year. So um, big scope night tomorrow, tune in, get a good seat, and we'll see you all then. Sounds good.